how do we get our body and brain prepared to be better? At the end of the day, if we use your definition, manifestation is simply about setting a goal and then achieving that goal. Mm -hmm. How do we get the brain and body better? And let's tease out each one of the top few Mm -hmm. items that you have to really walk people through like what that looks like in reality in creating it, Mm -hmm. right? What would be one of the first ones that you would say if we want to get better at this aspect of creating things in our life and achieving our goals? So 100%, the first and top one I would say is sleep. So when we're asleep, we are processing our memories, our emotions, um, and we're also you know, starting to mentally prepare ourselves for the next day and the next kind of chapter. And I'm going to put that together with something that's directly related to manifestation. So all of the benefits of sleep alone, adequate quality and length, that's basic science. If we add that together with the fact that if you visualize or look at your action board last thing at night, then you are priming your brain to tag in order of importance the items that are on your board or that you visualized just before you go to sleep. So in the state between being awake and falling asleep, also in the state between um, being asleep and waking up, those are two very powerful um, times to impact your subconscious. And if you can prime your subconscious to rate what's on your vision board or action board as more important than some of your like basic daily tasks obviously you you know we all have to go to work and do our job and tend to our family and put food on the table but those things are kind of automated what we want to do is is um rise up the automation of noticing the things that we want to manifest because if you've done that whilst you're falling asleep and then overnight then the next day, you're just more likely to notice things that you could actually grasp an opportunity. You could meet a person, you could you know, go to a different place or read something that you wouldn't read. All, all things that basically make up a patchwork that at some point you haven't realized it, but it's become a quilt. Mm. It's a bit like, to be honest, I'll say that about mindfulness as well. I, I no longer sit down and meditate formally. Yeah. Um, I did for years, but I got to the point where it started like a patchwork, like I was making, you know, just putting little patches, like not even together, but I would cook mindfully. I would eat mindfully. I would do some mindful walking. I would take digital detoxes. I would make sure that I gave my loved ones my absolute full attention, like not even thinking about, you know, what's on an email or a phone or whatever for, you know, certain periods of time. And then those things just started to knit together more and become, you know, loosely a quilt that's kind of going on 24 hours a day. Yeah. I love that you said that because I think especially in our space, meditation is so hip that the folks that had done it at some point in time, and I'm right in your same boat. I was a diligent meditator Mm -hmm. taking on different traditions and backgrounds Mm -hmm. and things in my early twenties and did that for years. And then inherently just didn't feel that call for that formal Mm -hmm. version of it. Mm -hmm. I got a little bit introduced to this work of this gentleman named Adashanti, and it's called spontaneous meditation, which Mm -hmm. is very similar to what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And then this component of, and of course, I know people will say, hey, meditation is different than mindfulness, but it being incorporated in my daily life through different versions of it. Mm -hmm. And maybe at some point in time, it'll shift and I'll go back to having a more formalized meditation Mm -hmm. structure, but it's not always... uh, cool to say that, hey, listen, I'm not meditating anymore, but that was something that was there, but I'm still weaving it in because at the end of the day, meditation is a vehicle that's taking you to, you know, everybody has a different definition of it, but mm-hmm. hopefully the present moment to be yeah. in in the now. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I shared that with a friend who is a big fan of my book, you know, super intelligent and successful in a very different field. And Two or three times she said to me, I couldn't, I just couldn't manage if I don't meditate. And and I felt like I was, maybe I was doing something wrong. <laughs> and again, being the scientist, it took for me to hear from some people who actually research in that area in New York to say that that is actually an evolution in, in on your spiritual path. 
Because if you think about it, even if you meditate for an hour a day, which I don't believe that most people do, that means that for one hour out of 24, you're being mindful. And for the other 23, you're living your normal life. But if you can merge those things so that all day is, you know, somehow not, you know, not every single hour, but more of your whole day is somehow incorporating mindfulness or a form of meditation, whether it's walking meditation or tasting meditation, then that's both more integrated, but it's also more time that you're spending in that mode. For sure. And everybody is going to have a different version of getting to that destination, mm. but it's good that people speak up and say, hey, this is how my journey has evolved. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, just like when you said, I was like, actually, I'm in that same boat over yeah. here. I've had to tell people who are huge fans of it. They're like, oh yeah, you're obviously a meditator, right? You're like so calm and chill and other stuff. And I'm like, I used to a lot and I'm not scared to admit that I'm not as much of right now, yeah. but that was a conscious choice that was there. And I'm sure it might change in the future. You know, another thought that I had is that this idea of looking at going back to the last question I asked you, your idea of the action board. And mm -hmm. we're going to get into like why you call it an action board. This idea of looking at that right before bedtime, because you're prioritizing sleep as one of those important things to tap into, to really supercharge your ability to step into manifestation mm -hmm. and the power of manifestation in the brain. People know that this is inherently true. I mean, how often is it that you watch Either for some people, it could be a scary movie or it could be a really intense film or it could even be a subject that you are even looking forward to. And then that night, what ends up happening? You have dreams all about that all evening and the next day, it's still kind of on your mind. It was occupying space all the night before just yeah. from watching something so intense yeah. the night before, which makes me feel so much for people who are literally watching news right until they sleep, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, all this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's funny, there's a gentleman here in um, in Los Angeles. I don't know if you've come across him before, Reverend Michael Beckwith? You yes. <laughs> okay, he's the founder of the Agape Center. He's very close with Oprah and did a bunch of her Super Soul Sundays. He has a great phrase. He says, you know, the news is simply a collection of the lowest common denominator of human society. Yeah. So basically, if you want to find out everything that's wrong, yeah. and increasingly you're starting to see that social media is kind of becoming that same sort of way, mm -hmm. because uh, even if you try to curate who you follow, I don't know if you've noticed this now, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter even, they show you things that they know are going to excite you even if you don't follow them. Have you seen this a little mm, bit? Yeah. So you get shown all this information, you're like... I'm not following that. Why all of a sudden am I getting connected to it? Anyways, I digress, but my heart goes out to people who right up until that very vulnerable space of, mm. you know, in Buddhism, they call it like ego death, right? Mm -hmm. Like going going to sleep. There's a little bit of baby ego death that happens when mm -hmm. you go to sleep each night. You're very vulnerable and you're getting exposed to all this negative imagery. Mm. No wonder that people wake up the next day and they're in a bad mood. Mm. They feel that there's no support for them. They feel that nothing works out. They feel that the world might be out to get to them, or they feel like they're not enough for all their creative ideas, visions, and goals mm -hmm. that they want to bring to their life to better themselves and the people that are around them. Mm. We have to, and I love that you said it. I'm going to probably clip it for social media. You know, that neuroscientists that you know are not watching the news, at least on like that regularity of a basis. Yeah. I feel like that's one big hack that could help so many people, mm -hmm. even with people addicted to their phones right before bed mm -hmm. at nighttime. We're so impressionable. And I don't think a lot of people understand how it's impacting us. No. And um, I'd like to add something to that, which is that, and I'll also share that, I mean, I love, I love a scary movie. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all about like people watching to watch whatever <laughs> yeah. they want to. It was just an example of yeah. how impressionable we are in these moments. <laughs> totally. And it's not like you're watching a scary movie every single no, night right no, before bed. No. Um, but even though I don't look at news and obviously m mostly bad news just before bed, I have this practice that I do in the morning because when you first wake up, you don't really know what you're suddenly going to think of. Like there might be something on your mind that you have to do that day or something that you're worried about. And I'm not saying that you don't come to those things and deal with them at some point in the morning, but before I even have time to think, the first thing that I do when I become aware that I'm awake and I'm still lying in bed is I say, I love my pillow. 
I love my pillowcase. I've got the best mattress in the world. I love my mattress topper. I love my silk duvet and all of my bedding. So that before I even have a chance to think, the first thing I've done is like talked about love and gratitude. You're setting the stage. You're priming your space and your brain. Mm. I love it. That's beautiful. <laughs> you know, going back to that, you had mentioned looking at your action board. Mm -hmm. right or at least some positive imagery that mm -hmm. reminds you of the life that you want to create mm -hmm. right or even as we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast the the beautiful things that you already have mm -hmm. family friends other things like that things that a lot of us t take it you know advantage of and you'll know, forget like it's natural the brain adapts and it gets used to it take for granted take for granted yeah. sorry not advantage yeah. um what is before we go through a few other things that might be mm -hmm. supercharging our ability Mm -hmm. to set goals and achieve them in our life. We're calling that manifestation here. Mm -hmm. What is an action board and why did you give it that name? Whereas most people identify it as a, as a vision board. Yeah. Tangibly, it's the same thing as a vision board in that it's a collage made up of images that represent either literally or metaphorically the things that you want in your life or how you want your life to look or feel. And that can actually be physically by hand with like paper and card, or it can be digitally. These days, people do them a lot more. Um, do you have a preference over one or the other? I would say a little bit like how we've described our meditation journeys, that if you're starting the practice, I would recommend doing it by hand. Yeah. But if you've been doing it for years, then it's probably okay to do it digitally. Mm. Although, so my current one is, is digital. It's on my phone. But the one next to my bed is my like most precious, successful, important one because I use that more to remind myself that, of what I'm capable of. Mm. So, and some of the things are themes that, you know, I would still want recurring in my life. So it's not like it's old things that I don't want anymore, but- When you say your most successful one, meaning that at when you were making this shift from being identified as, you know, just to use loose terms, like, I'm just a psychiatrist. I have to be in medicine. I'm mm -hmm. in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not creative. Mm -hmm. This was the board that got you shifted in a different direction. This was a bit later than that. So, okay. so this one I was already in my in the business that I'm in now. Okay, great. Um, it was more personal. Mm, got it. It has a special meaning for yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and but but whether it's personal or business, it represents the biggest change that I made in the. 15 or so years that I've been doing action yeah. boards. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, so where were we? So you were Why do I call was... them action boards? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the board itself is very similar to what people would recognize as a vision board. I do like the fact that it can be metaphorical, not just literal representation. So for example, if you looked at mine now, you might not understand exactly what the images mean to me, but I know exactly what they mean to me. Mm. Some of them are literal, but some of them aren't. So it's about the feeling that it creates for you as well as what you're seeing. The reason that I call them action boards instead of vision boards comes right back to what you were asking about at the start of the interview, which is, you know, why people might be skeptical about manifestation at all, and certainly about a scientist speaking about it. It's because I feel that prior to me using that different terminology, there was definitely a sense that you can create these images or create a fantasy in your mind and do nothing but sit at home and wait for it to come true. And it's all going to come to me. Yeah. And I don't believe that at all. Um, I would go as far as to say that if you create a vision board and you don't do anything to try to make it come true through your own hard work, it will never come true. Mm. It might even create a negative reinforcement because you feel like, well, this is all bullshit. But mm. you have to take the visioning and combine it with the action mm -hmm. and actually take a step forward, which takes courage sometimes, Yeah, which is why we're trying to prime the brain because the brain is exactly. reminding you yeah. like, hey, you've done this in the past or somebody else has done this in the past. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're stretching or yes, you have to take a little bit of a leap but it's possible because you're seeing that imagery every single day. There's two things. So there's that. You're absolutely right. The priming is the is the key between the visioning and the outcome manifesting in the real world. But it's it's exactly what you said, plus the fact that, I, which I've already explained, which is that 
we're automated to do certain things that we need to do to survive, like go to work, eat, you know, look after our families, have shelter. But we're not automated to get all the things on our vision board necessarily. Mm. So the priming is also to bring it to the front of your mind so that it doesn't just get ignored in, in a busy day. We're also busy. You know, a lot of people will say, I don't have time to manifest. Um, or there are other things that are more important in the short term that I need to do. And that's why my manifestations always just, you know, are in the background and never quite get the priority that they need. But if you prime your brain, then the first step is that you'll be more aware of these are the things I'm looking for. Oh, you know, that's a book that's relevant to something that I want to manifest, so I should read it. Um, and then the second step is what you've said, that you then have the courage and you go out and you do some things that you might not have done that are likely to bring you closer to that outcome. There's a quote I heard a few years ago. I can't remember where I got it from. So I'll have to look at the end of the episode and we'll put it in the show notes, but mm. I'd love to hear your take on it. And the quote, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, is the universe, which can mean a lot of different things to people. Source, we could be talking about. Your book is titled Source. Mm -hmm. You could replace it with God if that's your belief system. But the universe is constantly conspiring for your greater good. Mm -hmm. The only question is if you're noticing. Mm -hmm. Does that fit within the idea of taking the different worlds that you're bringing together, manifestation, neuroplasticity, and a little bit of your own spiritual tradition? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm being the scientist, then I would say we can't currently prove that yeah, that's an no actual fact. That maybe goes more into the quantum physics, which is not a conversation we're having right now. No, but but I'm not against it because what I feel like it's really saying is that we're not starting from, you know, like you said, if people watch bad news till late at night, to me, the message that they're really giving to themselves is the world is not a safe place. That is the most basic belief that you are carrying around if you're constantly bombarded with news of violence and death and unfairness and poverty. So if you hear this beautiful phrase, the universe is constantly, um, you know, working to help you get the things that you want, then what that's really saying to you is the world is a safe place. Mm. So now you go and do what you can to make your life better. Yeah. But because it's taking away the view that, well, I can't risk going to do those things because look at all the bad things that are happening in the world. And if I, you know, if I put myself out there, then something bad could happen. It's it's taking that away. And I think that's really important. And I, you know, I, of course, am an advocate of the, you know, comfort that spirituality can get you. I'm just also saying as a scientist that you you have to do something, you know, you of can't course. just rely on that. So Yeah, and the thing that I think of that lines perfectly with action is the question, the second part of that, you know, first part is the universe is constantly conspiring to your greater good, mm. right? Again, that's not a scientific statement, right? Could be a spiritual statement mm -hmm. for some people. The second part being the only question is are you willing to notice it. Mm. And the noticing goes right into the action mm. that you're looking at your action board at night and you want to build a business. You want to write a book. You want to do something. And then you're having a conversation with a friend in a coffee shop and they go up to go to the bathroom and you see somebody in the corner and they're reading a book that's like right on the topic that's there. Mm. And it's like, you could strike up a, strike up a conversation. Mm. It's like, what's that book? What is it meant for you? What is this? So many beautiful things in my life have come from just these little tiny happenstances yeah. that have been the magical serendipity or intersection, mm. but I had to still take action towards it and say hi to somebody or pick up this book or mm -hmm. order this thing mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. And that took me down a whole rabbit hole mm. that led to momentum, more action, and eventually some outward version of success on that particular project. Yeah. And it might not even be that you see someone reading that book, so you go and have a conversation with them. I, I definitely believe in signs. But for me, if I see, if I notice signs, it's because my brain is primed for something that I know I want. And then it's like, okay, why? You know, what is it that you keep noticing and why are you noticing that? And what does it mean that you actually want to manifest? So then it could mean that I go and have a different conversation with somebody else, but yeah. it's the fact that I've noticed that book title for some particular reason. Or Yeah, and would you have noticed it if you didn't have that priming the night before the action steps? I wanna ask you a little bit more about any other best practices around mm -hmm. action boarding. Mm -hmm. 
if somebody wanted to create one action board for, let's say, you know, one area of their life, mm -hmm. or this one's for business, this one's for love, this one's for that. Are, are there any best practices? You know, people have a lot of things that they want to attract, a mm -hmm. lot of things that they want to create in their life. Are there any do's and don'ts, best practices that you have when it comes to this general topic? Yeah. Um, so I don't do it like that, but I do know people who've done separate action boards and had great success. So like you said, it's, it's what's right for different people. Because... I think because I'm a neuroscientist, but also because I'm a real people person, I'm all about interconnection. So for me, I like to have everything on one board. And I even like to think about, uh, I, I do have sections, so it's not completely random. It is in sections like work and you know family and health and stuff like that. But sometimes I might make sure that they touch each other because mm. to me, there's a connection between- The pattern recognition yeah, between them, as you yeah. were saying earlier. And even like the order- that they are like arranged in next to each other and where they are on the board. So again, it doesn't have to make sense to to anyone else particularly, but like for me, like top left is usually about love because your heart's on your left-hand side. And, and to me, like love is the most important thing in the world. So I'm always gonna put it on the top. Um, central is usually obviously an important place. And then then it sounds like, oh no, well, whatever you're putting on the bottom obviously isn't very important, but I always think of that as foundational. So to me, that's usually about home. Um, but, you know, that's like one year I did it like that and other years I might change it around, but it will always make sense to me. So it's not everything on it makes sense to me. That's really important. And then I used to, and I said, well, I, I didn't ever like crowd my board up too much, but it used to be fairly full, but I see people really really crowding their boards up and I often say I always say if I see that is that what you want your life to look like because to me that's really hectic mm. like I would like to have some space in my life so I usually leave some space just because when I look at my board I want to feel calm I want to exhale I don't want to look at it and think oh my god there's so many things on there um I feel like it's just like overwhelming so that's a feeling but equally what I've come to realize over the years is that I don't know everything <laughs> and there might be things that could happen to me that I haven't imagined yet and I want to be open to those things as well. So one of the reasons I now justify leaving space is that I'm allowing room for magic to happen that I can't even envisage yet. I so, love that. Yeah. That's beautiful. What are some of the things that you see that get in the way of people actually taking action on creating an action board, right? I think one that I'll just acknowledge that we talked about before is that people feel, which is why you're on this podcast today, that it's like, this is kind of bogus. It's not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think another one that I'll toss in before I pass it over to you mm -hmm. that I've definitely felt early on when I first heard of this work mm -hmm. early on in my sort of personal development journey is some version of feeling kind of vulnerable, wanting to put out there the things that you want to ask for mm, in your life, totally. right? Yeah, It can be very vulnerable. And I know there's different schools of thoughts. Some people are like, hey, I want to show people my vision board, action mm -hmm. board. And some people are like, no, I want to be more protective. I definitely in the early journey of mine mm. was more like, hey, this is kind of for me. So I'm just kind of holding space for it. But part of that was I didn't feel at that time ready to be able to say like, well, why is that thing on there? And what does that mean? I didn't want mm. a lot of questions, mm -mm. especially from people who I was kind of the first in my friend group and family yeah. to really go down this you know, path of yeah. personal development, spirituality, visioning, you know, all that sort of world. Um, so I would have been more, I would have felt more vulnerable, yeah. you know, and I would, I would wanted to protect my goals and visions in life. Uh, I didn't want people saying like, oh, that's crazy. Why do you think that you could achieve that? Right, which I think is a real thing. Right? Totally. You don't want that negative yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of thing. No, I'm I'm laughing with you because I know that that happens, and I I'm imagining that, you know, for the amount of time that you've been in this area, that it's it was probably harder as a guy to be open about things like that. I think, you know, when I started being open about it, and I started being open about it when I started, and I maybe kind of went the other way a bit in that, like, as time's gone on, I'm a bit more private about my boards, but. I think that, you know, along with the skepticism that comes with it is that, that 
you know, it is a thing more that women do than men, for example, maybe. Mm. Um, more that's, yeah, that it's a feminine sort of thing that people have. That it's quite practice. It's seen as quite feminine. It's certainly seen as more spiritual than scientific. Um, like, I guess there's many ways that it's seen, but let me address your first question, which is that it's bogus. Well, okay. Maybe it is bogus, but try it once because if it doesn't work, it's not going to harm you. If somebody's going to give it a real shot, how long should they try the process for? And I even say that with if you go in thinking like, okay, let's see if this thing works and your hands are crossed for those people who can't see me on YouTube, you're already coming in with a little bit of negativity yeah. you know, to that component. Yeah. But if somebody's like, no, I want to do this. I want to pay attention. I want to kind of follow the methodology that's there in, in the book. Link in the show notes for anybody who wants to check it out, the source. What is a good amount? What is some time? You're saying try it. What, mm. what is an appropriate amount of time to give this a shot? Mm -hmm. Well, I do my boards and I recommend that people do an annual one mm -hmm. because it's not too short term. These things do need time. And the only reason they need time is that manifestation is based on neuroplasticity. And that means that you have to change a neural pathway in your brain. And that takes time. It depends what it is. So... Usually I say that if there are some what look like quick wins on your board, do everything that you can to make them come true because then you're giving yourself evidence that it works and it's a you're cumulative. stacking up the receipts. Yeah, you're stacking up the receipts. It's cumulative. Um, and some things will naturally take longer, but if you're still staring at this board and there's absolutely nothing on it that's happening, then that can be quite demotivating and it's really important to stay motivated. But I do want to say as well that although... I'm a huge advocate of action boards. It isn't the only way that you can manifest. And, and there are some ways that may be more appealing to people with more masculine energy or who are less spiritual. And so an obvious one is, is a list. So a list of things that you want. You know, that I think seems less bogus, right? So that, and there'll be a lot of people who will say, well, I'm not going to do a vision board, but they might already have a list and they, but they don't talk about it. Yeah. Or they have a list and they do talk about it. And then... There are actually, there's a small group of people who neurologically cannot visualize. So for them, I've suggested creating a soundtrack of success. Mm. So you can basically choose song titles or music that you know, make you feel that same way, like that you've achieved something that you want. Um, you can even create a smell of success. So you can have a particular essential oil or combination that represents to you that you've achieved, you know, whatever it is that might be on your your manifestation list or board so there are other ways of doing it um and the amount of time really does depend what it is like it's to me it's similar to that question how long does it take to form a habit it really depends what it is you know if it's i'd like to be doing some form of exercise three times a week then you could probably you know get that going in a few weeks but if it's I need to like completely change how emotionally intelligent I am. That's going to take nine, 10, 12 months. Um, but both are achievable. I, the, the simplest analogy for me is how long would it take you to learn a language? And basically, what, what languages do you speak? I speak uh, Gujarati mm -hmm. and English. Okay. Yeah. So you're bilingual. So let's say you want so, so you, you probably would find it easier than somebody that's not to learn another language let's say you decide to learn Spanish okay so you could either use Duolingo and be self-motivated with no particular end goal and you can imagine like how well that might go or you could go to a Spanish class every week and you could book a vacation to Mexico in six months time and it's likely that you would be much better at Spanish if you did that than if you did the first way so it's like that with, with a habit or, and with your manifestations, which is that it it depends how difficult the thing is. And it also depends how much effort you put in to, to make it come true. And I would say, I think this is kind of what you were asking before as well, is there's also an element of self-sabotaging behaviors. And the first thing I see is not so much people who don't do action boards because they wouldn't really be talking to me. So sure. it's, People who talk to me want to do an action board, but I've seen quite a few people who find the images but do not glue them down. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What do you think is going on there? And actually, we have a friend in common who's done that. I'm not going to say who it is on the podcast, but <laughs> I'll tell you. You don't want to put them on blast? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
It was I was actually on her podcast when she shared that though, but it was wow. years ago. And I said to her on the podcast, from my experience, there's only one reason that you are not gluing them down and that's because you don't believe that you deserve them. Wow. Wow. And that really resonated for her. Mm. So I think there's the desire to do it and the, you know, the knowledge of what it is that you might want, but then there's that the deservingness. You know, I mentioned that at the start. It's it's really important. If you don't believe that you deserve those things, you you're not, you know, not gluing them down is really what's going on inside is I don't I don't really think that's going to happen. So mm. if I put it there, it's going to lead to failure. Similar with sharing. I mean, I think people are different levels of private, right? So I'm not saying that everybody has to share their their vision board at all. But if you feel confident enough about it, like when I, my first one, I had a, I had a small apartment with like one bathroom and it was on the wall in the bathroom. So if anybody came to my apartment and used the bathroom, they would see it. But obviously the only people that were coming to my apartment and using the bathroom were like close friends. So that was okay. And what I experienced from that was that it was very inspiring for people and they were genuinely interested. And not only was it inspiring in terms of they might do something similar, but because it was my closest friends, I would literally get text messages and phone calls saying, oh, you know that thing on your vision board? Well, I know somebody who's doing blah, blah, blah. They and I can introduce you, you to happen. Yeah, exactly. That's beautiful. Mm. I love that. Do New Year's resolutions actually work or is there a better way to get ready for the next year ahead? Yeah, so exactly what I said. People tend to set ones that are too large and basically set themselves up to fail. So doing the two to three habits a quarter, which ends up with 10 or 12 little changes that you've made by the end of the year, I've definitely personally found that that works much better and it makes sense from the neuroscience why that would work better as well. So when you are gearing up to set those yourself, is, is that something that you do? And mm -hmm. are there any practical ways that that's combined with or stacked on top of all the things you've talked about in the previous episode, like your action board? Um, oh, well, the action board is a, you know, that's, that's a must that's there all year. Um, and I think the thing about that one is, you know, in the source, I do write about patience as being an element of that as well, because if you're changing habits, you know, we're in the section of habits and often reaching a, a new goal does involve you changing a habit, then it takes time for those neural pathways to get built up, you know, for the neurons to make connections. And there's a definite tipping point where a new habit becomes something that you're now comfortable with that's natural for you. And that connects up to the fact that I've mentioned micro habits because they're easier to cultivate, but they have this kind of cumulative effect. Um, so... I don't know if I've ever done this consciously, but I like what you're saying, which is that if I look at my action board and I say I see something that requires me to make a change in the way that I operate, then absolutely I could include that, though, you know, what will lead up to that as some of my micro habits that I'll change. Um, so, you know, a classic example is someone that says, I really want to have a family. But instead of taking supplements and eating super healthily and getting early nights, they might go out partying a lot because they think that's how they'll meet somebody that they can have a family with. So it's about adjusting that and thinking, okay, if I'm a certain age and I'm serious about having a family, then there are things that I need to do to keep my body in the right condition that I should really prioritize. Uh, so many questions here about sort of things people are curious about what you do. So kind of putting what you said with some of the questions that I have, is there a micro habit that you are focused on right now of adding into your world? Yeah, so one that I'm, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, I've been traveling for quite a long time at the moment. So I'll, I'll be home in a, a week or two. The one that I'm going to be adding in, and I do need to work out how to make it micro enough that I'm actually going to do this, is adding in more resistance training to my physical exercise. Mm. And I have to tell you, this is, for all the right reasons that you might imagine, but also because I just read a paper in Nature, which shows the difference between resistance training and aerobic training and how it contributes to the quality of your skin. Mm. So like the thickening of the dermal layer. Um, so it's incredible. You know, once I read that, I was like, okay, I definitely want to do that for all sorts of reasons, muscle tone, bone mass, um, 
but also skin. So I've got to go home, look at the weight of the weights that I've got, decide, you know, whether I need to do light weights or slightly heavier, how many reps, and then kind of just slowly bring that in because I haven't been doing that so much for a while. That's exciting. As somebody who, that was my sort of main focus last year when okay. I turned 40 and it it shifted my life. Yeah. I grew up being sort of under eating on protein, you know, growing up in sort of the being Indian and vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. Playing sports and always being active, but not having resistance training be a regular mm. part of my life. I got serious about it last year from guidance from a friend of mine, mm. a, a medical doctor, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. And I felt it completely shifted my approach in life. I felt stronger. Mm. I felt uh, more awake in my mind, even though I always felt like my mind was working pretty well. Yeah. I felt like I had more ability to focus, pay attention. I felt that drive and that energy. And on a, uh, we just did an episode yesterday all about testosterone. Mm -hmm. I almost increased my testosterone just through strength training and increasing my protein by a hundred uh, points or whatever the marker yeah. is. I was wow. like in the low uh, 500s and, I, and mm -hmm. I've gotten close now to almost 600. Wow. And so- there's a massive difference that I've felt and my blood glucose improved. Mm -hmm. So I, as somebody who that was my focus last year and is going to continue to be my focus because I care about longevity, I can't wait to see when you come back on the podcast Thanks. next time <laughs> all, how great you feel. Thank you. <laughs> and just another tip for you. I don't know if you know this, but one of the best ways to boost testosterone is to do weight training followed by eating cabbage because hmm. there's a compound in cabbage that... Um, helps conversion to testosterone. So because oh, you, you kind of think do the weight training and then eat a steak or something like that. But actually cabbage is a really good one. Well, can I eat a steak and some cabbage yes. so I can get the protein <laughs> yeah. and then get whatever the beneficial compounds are yeah, in yeah. cabbage too? Yeah, absolutely. That's the meal, <laughs> steak and cabbage. Here's a really great uh, question. Also continue on habits. Uh, you've recently launched season two of your podcast. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Thanks. by the way. We have a link to your podcast in the show notes below. Please, everybody, follow along on the podcast. What has Dr. Tara learned from season two specifically about habits? Is there any new information or any new science that we should all be aware of? I love this question. Season two has literally been life-changing for me. So in season one, you know, there was a lot of anxiety about launching something new and kind of getting it right and following a formula that I thought was how it should be. For season two, I really just followed my curiosity. I had been previously interested in ancient and indigenous wisdom, but had kind of had to, well, you know, I was still reading about it out of personal interest, but um, it, for various reasons, wasn't a priority professionally. So when I introduced the idea of that being a theme for season two and everyone in the team loved it. That was great. So already we've, we're only ha having episode four this week. So it's kind of early days, but from episode one, I realized I learned that the habit of doing something creative most days of the week has massive benefits for your mental health, your physical health and your longevity. From episode two, which was mostly about terminal lucidity and near-death experiences, I learned that the habit of being kind and compassionate and having mercy for other people throughout your whole life mm. is going to make you feel better about yourself on your deathbed. Um, episode three was about the gut microbiome, but the thing I learned as a habit there, which will be interesting for you too, is that it's really important to eat for your gut microbiome in terms of your genetic or cultural heritage. And so, you know, I do love Indian food and I do eat quite a lot of it, but I didn't quite understand how much more important it is for me to be eating enough spices and, you know, lentils and things like that. So I've been paying more attention to that. And, you know, whatever the listener's cultural heritage is, thinking about the kind of foods that grew in the country that you came from, or what the staple diet of your grandparents was is, is a good habit to return to. Um, and the episode that's coming out this week is um, with the COO of a beautiful retreat in India called Anandra in the Himalayas. And he talks about Ayurveda and yoga and all sorts of things, but his family were really into classical music. And so 
we understand there the research about the importance of chanting and humming and mantras. You know, these are really primal things that we did when we lived in the cave. And we didn't really have the luxury of doing things for fun when we lived in the cave. So we we did everything we did was because it had a benefit for your health or your you know, your life. Um, so literally in every episode, I am picking up a new habit. Mm, that's exciting. You know, so much of getting ready for the next year ahead is also honoring how much has happened this year or even previous years, how far somebody has come. We chatted a little bit about this on the first episode, mm. but is that weaved into your year-end review in any way that is formalized or written down or structured? Yeah, so I have my journaling practice. Um, and when I start writing about what I want to happen next year, I will do a review of what I wanted for this year and kind of, you know, see how I've done in that. But that just, that whole practice is much bigger for me now than it ever was because I was very guilty of never acknowledging what I'd achieved and just moving on to the next thing I have to achieve. Can so that was a big change for me. Where, where, where do you think that that came from? Um, <laughs> I don't want to blame my parents for everything, but they had very high standards and, you know, had a lot of expectation on me, parental, societal, school. Um, so I think that I was a high achiever. I didn't really have a good practice for acknowledging what I've achieved. It was always about then like, what else can you do? Um, so I think it's probably my personality and then also kind of the environment that I grew up in. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, so much compassion for your parents, my parents, a lot of immigrant parents that were there mm -hmm. because so much of their life was focused on survival. Yeah. Hey, we moved to this new country. We have to get ahead. There's no luxury to be thinking about the past no. at all whatsoever. No. It's about how do we, especially for our kids, establish some level of success in a new sort of society that we're in mm -hmm. to get them in a place where they have some ability to have security about the future, mm -hmm. right? So I can imagine now anything too far one way or another obviously has its downsides, but it's great that you are now sort of bringing these worlds together, the East and the West, and taking a moment and say, you know what? We don't have to sprint all the time. Mm -hmm. We can take a moment because unchecked success at all costs will ultimately eat us alive. And that was many of the executives that you were working with mm. back in the day. Mm. And so a couple of thoughts have come to my mind, which is that I hear a lot of parents of young children now saying that, you know, everybody's a winner. Everybody gets a prize. How are these children going to deal with difficulty later in their life? And I think that a lot of immigrant cultures raise their children in almost the opposite way, which is that we know life is going to be hard. And if our children experience some hardship early on, they'll be more resilient later. Mm. So, and I do think there's a balance between those two, because like you said, either of those two can be a bit extreme. Um, and I had another thought, which has just slipped my mind, but I'm sure it will come back to me. So I'll mention it then. It'll come back to you. It'll come back to you. One of the things that I'll add in that I love to do at the end of the year is to go through month by month and just ask myself, you know, three basic questions. What's something, even if it was tough, I managed managed to either accomplish it or make progress on it, no mm -hmm. matter how big or small. Mm -hmm. And again, we tend to forget about these things, these challenging things that we attempted, mm -hmm. even made progress on. Maybe we made progress on the goal of weight training, mm -hmm. but it never became a full habit in our life, mm -hmm. but we learned so much. Mm -hmm. And now we're way more confident and we're ready to make it a staple in our life, mm. whatever it is, mm. no matter how big or small. The next question is, who's someone, no matter how big or small, that I did something for? Mm. Who did I help? No matter how big or small, who's someone that I helped that I did something for? Mm. And the last one, which is very important, who's someone that did something for me, no matter how big or small? Mm. And when I go through First of all, this takes me a couple hours to go through the entire wow. calendar. And it's yeah. easy if I have my diary or calendar in front of me because I forget what was happening in February. I what know. was I up to? Yeah, yeah. But you look at your calendar, you see what meeting you had. Oh, I had a lunch with Dr. Tara, you know, or I did this, I did that. 
oh my gosh, she introduced me to that person afterwards. Oh my, that, that totally opened my eyes. And I did this other episode, which helped me with this. You're filled with so much gratitude for the people that are around you that have supported you, but also you're filled with so much gratitude for yourself. Hmm. And I find that when you enter into the new year with that vibration, it's a whole different energy around setting goals. Most people, when they're talking about goals and resolutions, as you've talked about, they don't work. They're coming from such a place of lack. Mm. Oh, I want to accomplish this. Why? Well, I feel like I'm not there yet. I want to make more money or I want to find the right partner in my life. Yeah. Well, okay. Those are all beautiful things, but how about everything that went right this year? And doesn't mean that you can't have those goals. It's just, can we at least acknowledge you for how hard you've tried this year? Yeah. And I think, you know, if you don't do that, then how do, you, how do you get the confidence that you're going to achieve the things that you want to achieve next year by acknowledging the things that you have achieved, especially if some of them were seemed a little difficult or out of reach, then you're going to be much more confident about the future. But I agree with you. It's all about gratitude. I mean, you know, part of my, the way that I look at my action board is visualize my goals for next year becoming true and then giving gratitude in, in advance for those things becoming true. Mm. That's powerful. Um, following up on the topic of micro habits and habits, one of the things that you are known for and that you write about a lot in the book is the importance of taking on new tasks mm -hmm. or goals that challenge your brain in a healthy way. Because when you challenge your brain, you are creating neuroplasticity mm -hmm. and you are essentially growing your brain. Mm -hmm. So do you think about, or rather a question here is how does Dr. Tyra think about picking challenging goals next on her list to essentially help her brain grow? I love that question. Um, so yeah, I just want to start by saying whatever you pick, there are other positive consequences of challenging your brain in that way. So let's say you pick learning Spanish. Of course, then you could travel in South America on vacation and like get around much more easily and speak to people. But there are what's called global benefits to your brain of learning anything new, which mostly affects your executive functions, which are the highest functions of the brain. So things like being able to regulate your emotions, think flexibly, think creatively, solve co complex problems, override your biases. So, you know, that is actually kind of the main reason for learning something new. So it kind of doesn't matter that much what you learn. I just go with, with what, you know, crops up for me that year. So sometimes it's learning a language because I'm spending time in a place where English isn't the first language. Um, you know, during the pandemic, it was tennis because it was something you could do outside and, you know, it was physical exercise and, um, and then, you know, I had a, a time, you know, we all struggled during the pandemic. I was struggling to see the positive side of things. It was just really easy to start focusing on the fact that you were locked up and couldn't go anywhere and couldn't see anyone. And so then I did a six month neuroplasticity training on just improving my happiness levels, you know, just how, how I would perceive things um, and noticing small things like a beautiful flower that had blossomed instead of bigger things like I can't go anywhere on vacation. Um, yeah, so it really kind of, I don't pick something artificially in advance. I wait to see what's coming up for me that year that would constitute a good learning that's relevant to my life at the time. You follow your gut intuition? Yeah. We have a question about the gut. We're going to come back to it. <laughs> okay. Here's a question. It could be a good opportunity to summarize a little bit of your overall beliefs around this area. But it says, for those of us who suffer from alcohol or sugar or social media addiction, mm -hmm. is it truly possible for us to re rewire our brain and break free from these addictions? So from the neuroscience point of view, I always put motivation and addiction on a spectrum. And so motivation is when something that you like or you want improves your life in some way. So, you know, whether that's it improves your life socially or it just picks up your energy temporarily. Um, and then when it tips over into addiction is when 
two things. One is that you need more of the same thing to have the same effect. And the second one is that you're doing this activity, you know, drinking alcohol, eating sugar, whatever it is, and it's no longer good for you. It's got to the level where it's no longer good for you. So that's that's kind of that slim difference between motivation and addiction. I mean, I have to say, as I'm speaking so generally to a, a, you know, a wide audience, that I would advise that you get help to work on something that's become an addiction. It's quite difficult to do it yourself. Um, and depending on what it is and for different personality types, it may be that you either have to completely cut that thing out of your life or it may be that you can minimize it and take it back to the level of it's motivating. You know, it's got some positive in your life rather than it's in the addiction side of the spectrum. Beautiful. You chatted a little bit about this earlier, but talk to us about any science around the idea, neuroscience, about focusing on getting 1% better each day. Where's their truth to it? And where, well, actually, yes, is there truth to it? Yeah, I, I think there is. So let's, rather than sort of being too pedantic about 1%, let's say like something that you can do that's not a big effort for you, but is definitely a change in the way that you operate. So the easiest example is, well, I mean, I'm from England, so I'm going to talk about public transport, which maybe isn't that relevant here, but like, or, you know, even if you're taking Uber or you're driving, it's like getting off the bus two stops before your stop and walking extra. So maybe that is parking somewhere further away than as close as you possibly can to the office and getting a walk in. So just a small change to your physical activity, the amount of physical activity you do and the habit that you have to, you know, the thing that you have to change in order to do that, which is like park somewhere different. Um, things like, you know, drink an extra glass of water each day, really small things. But if you start drinking a bit more water, then your body gets used to that. And it, you know, kind of the point at which you become dehydrated changes for you and then you end up being hydrated most of the time or you go from doing less than 5,000 steps a day to regularly doing more than 5,000 steps a day and then maybe even building that up to 10,000 going to bed an hour earlier I'm talking about really small things like this and I I do and I personally started with all of these brain healthy habits so I got myself up to 8,015 minutes of sleep um, one and a half liters of water, 10,000 steps per day. Once you've got all of that done, your brain is actually so fueled and in such a good condition that then if you say, I want to learn a new language or I want to write a song or I want to start a podcast, then you've got you know more resources in your brain to be able to do that kind of thing. Mm. This goes back to that old adage, we tend to overestimate what we can do in a day or in a week and underestimate what's possible for us over the course of a year or even five. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to especially New Year's goals, New Year's resolutions, people getting ready for the next year, using the end of the year as an opportunity to reflect, mm -hmm. there's so much emphasis on these big audacious goals and not enough emphasis on these tiny habits that could truly change people's lives. I agree. And you're making me think of, um, I don't know if you've read The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Skimmed. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say when I've skimmed a book. Okay. I do need to read it, <laughs> yeah. but I've skimmed it. Yeah. So it's got <laughs> lots of interesting um, concepts in it. But the one that really struck me, I read it a few years ago before the pandemic, was about the angel of death coming to you and saying, um, I've come to collect you. It's time to go. And that faced with this, most people would say, please give me another week, please, you know, and the angel of death would say, I've given you so many weeks, why didn't you use them like mm. you wanted to? And so a week was quite dramatic. So I sort of thought to myself, okay, if, if I knew that I had a year to live, what would I do differently? And, you know, I had a very clear answer in my mind about that. So I think one thing we could do as well is not to focus on regrets, because I, I really don't do regrets. I, I feel like everything that I've done or not done has led to me being who I am right here, right now, today. But maybe thinking, if I could have changed a few things this year, what what would those things be? Because that's a, probably a really good indicator of what you might want to do next year. Mm. 
Would you mind sharing off the cuff oh, if there me. was anything that you would shift um, this year looking back? Again, it's not about regrets, but how you might want to use the inspiration of things that uh, maybe went in one direction this year and next year you might want to take them in a different direction. Overall, I'm definitely going in the direction that I want to because, you know, I'm on this journey to like be more creative and do more creative things. Um, one thing I have really noticed several times because I've traveled a lot this year is that I've got to the point a few times this year where I've thought I need to just be grounded at home for a while. Mm. And I've done that maybe for six weeks at a time, but I think each time wasn't really long enough. Um, and I have sort of questioned myself about why I've traveled so much. I mean, on the one hand, it's easy to say I've had these incredible opportunities that you wouldn't turn down, but, but equally I haven't really done the right amount of balance with being grounded at home. So I haven't really got the answer to that yet, but I definitely need to be mindful of that next year. We have a question here about someone who wants to build confidence and command respect. If I could contextualize it in the interview, I would say, Dr. Tara, how do I build confidence and command respect through the 1% approach? What are some habits or things that I could be doing in my life to help me build more confidence on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, you know how I normally try to answer as widely as possible so it's as helpful to as many people as possible. I'm gonna go the other way with this one because I'm imagining this person sitting in front of me and I want to say what I would really say to somebody if they came to me as a coaching client with that question. The first, you know, my gut has immediately gone to, why do you need to command respect? Mm. And where I would question this person is, is there a lack of self-respect that's driving your need to command respect? Mm. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't really go around each day thinking I want to command respect. So, <laughs> so it feels like there's something behind that, you know, so I would want to know more about that. Um, I mean, building confidence is one thing, but then I think the respect thing has probably a lot more context to it. So I would say, if I want to answer that really easily and from the heart, I think that, you know, living in love and gratitude really helps to build your confidence because it kind of, you know, takes us all back to the essence of who we are. And you can't really go wrong if you're living, you know, just in love and gratitude for like everyone that you meet and yourself and everything that happens to you during the day. Usually, um, confidence has dropped for a reason. You know, if you're saying, okay, I need to build it, it's usually because something may have happened that has affected your confidence. So definitely journaling about that. Um, and I would also return to the usual self-care, but add in, a bit, you know, a bit more. So make sure you're sleeping enough, that you're eating as healthily as you can, drinking water, moving a bit. But then maybe something like taking a bath with nice essential oils or self-massage or, um, you know, spending quality time with friends or just, you know, something that makes you feel that you are actually taking time to nurture yourself. And it's not just about getting the basics done. You know, it's, it's the, there's something more where you're kind of prizing yourself. And I do have a very specific exercise that I love, which you can do in the shower or if you're like moisturizing your body, which is that as you touch each part of your body or think of each part of your body, you give gratitude for what it does for you. So like my feet for walking me around all day, my skin for protecting the boundary of my body my eyes for seeing, my um, you know, sort of like fingertips for feeling things like so sensitively. And as you go through and you thank your the parts of your body, it really does increase your like self-love and confidence. Mm. Most of the neuroscientists that I know, all the ones I know personally and other ones that I've heard of, don't watch the news mm. or read newspapers. That's powerful. And it's not because we don't want to be informed, because obviously we do manage to stay informed in other ways of important events around the world. But if you just look at the nature of news, the the proportion of it that is bad news and the impact that that has on your brain is is disproportionate. So the first thing is to curate your news feeds, your social media feeds, so that you're not getting bombarded with so much bad news and you, and you balance that out for yourself. Of course, life can be hard. 
So yes, you have to be resilient as well. But the first thing is to take charge of, of what you're actually feeding your brain. And that's everything from your diet to information. How is it that regularly exposing ourselves to negativity or sort of fear-based media, what does that do to the brain and how is that actually happening? So we, we've come onto the subject of neuroplasticity, yeah. which is essentially neurons that fire together, wire together. Now, every time you meet somebody, experience an emotion, recall a memory, watch the news, neurons are uh, you know, firing in response to, to what you're experiencing through all of your senses and you know, the information that you're taking in. So neuroplasticity is an incredible thing, but what we need to not forget is that it can be as bad as it can be good. Mm. So if you repeatedly look at bad news, if you repeatedly obsess over a, you know, a bad relationship or a breakup that you had, you are going to be embedding that wiring more deeply in your brain. So it's a force for good, but it also can be reinforced. I don't want to say bad, but unproductively. What, mm. what are some of the habits and addictions that people, even maybe people listening today, that are dealing with certain behaviors they don't want? Mm -hmm. What are some examples of those that their brain is kind of in hijacked by this pathway, but for quote unquote bad, mm -hmm. right? What, what would be some addictions, habits, behaviors that people are suffering from today that, that is an example of this? Yeah, so I like the way you framed that as not good at good or bad. We could say positive or negative or, you know, it's productive, non-productive. Um, and so through my work, which is, which is very varied. So, you know, I work with executives, mostly in financial services. I teach at MIT Sloan. Um, I work with a very different demographic through my social media and through, you know, people that read my book and listen to my podcast. But I see the same issues surfacing across the board. And this is based on the dopaminergic pathways in the brain, which are related to motivation. So motivation is um, the neurological mechanism that makes us seek something that's good for us. But motivation and addiction are on a spectrum. So something that used to be good for us, if we overdo it or we're doing it and somehow it's starting to actually not have the same effect, so we have to do more of a certain action to get the same reward, that can become destructive. And Obviously, drugs and alcohol are examples of that that everyone will understand. But I'm talking about things like being a workaholic, so mm. working excessive hours, over-exercising, um, particularly in a really high-intensity way that actually creates more cortisol and stress in the body. Um, so basically, screen time. And the story that I hear with this is... It's really important in my job to be responsive. I always reply to emails straight away and I get rewarded for that. And then that can, at the other end of the spectrum, be I'm constantly scrolling social media. I'm working across time zones. I'm looking at my phone in the middle of the night. So you can see with all of those things how, you know, being having a good work ethic is great, but working excessive hours and damaging your health and your relationships isn't. Mm. Doing, you know, not being sedentary is good but exercising to the point, and, and I see it with the most high achieving people, you know, the high flyers, the the professional services, the lawyers. The, the, I, I met a lawyer at a lunch party and um, as soon as she said she d does this intense, super intense high, you know, high, um, really like challenging exercise, the first thing I said to her was, you're exactly the kind of person that shouldn't be doing that. Mm. You should be doing yoga and walking and, and she sort of said, I know straight away, which means that you even, you know that it's bad for you, but you, you still keep doing it because that original driver is exercise must be good for you. And I'm sweating out my stress by doing it. But it's just really good to step back every so often and check, is this still good for me? Um, and the same with obviously using screens and social media. I'm going to jump around a little bit as we sort of stack and build a little bit of your background to the audience. We're of course going to come to your story, which is so fascinating. I'm going to go back to a little bit of the beginning of the interview because I think, you know, my audience here, this podcast used to be called the Broken Brain Podcast. Mm. We've done a lot of episodes on brain health. What our, my audience is not used to hearing so much about 
is an Oxford, MIT trained, you know, doctor, professor talking about manifestation. That is new for them. And maybe even some people thinking, is manifestation real? Is it not real? So I'd love to start off here. Tell us what manifestation is and tell us what it isn't. Yeah, so it's definitely had a bad, you know, sort of rep. Um, and I think that is just for all the different definitions and possible journeys to manifest, you know, the umbrella term of manifestation, you know, that that one can have. But as a scientist, if I were to say to you that manifestation is not much more than you setting a goal and making that come true in real life, then there shouldn't be any argument that it could be quite scientific. Mm. Um, and when I wrote The Source, which came out in 2019, so I was writing it in 2018, I was, I'd was i always personally been interested in spirituality and visualization and manifestation, but I felt like there was no overlap with my professional work at the time. I was, I'd, you know, until recently been a psychiatrist. Um, and I already had my PhD in neuroscience. So when I started looking into the science behind manifestation, for me personally, I had to be able to explain it based on cognitive science, which is psychology and neuroscience, just for it to make sense to me. That wasn't necessarily even the book that I was going to write, but I had to feel like, okay, I really understand how this works. And then what am I gonna do with that? How am I gonna share that with people? But the fact that explaining manifestation through cognitive science means that it's your brain that makes these things come true felt extremely empowering. If if it had to be blind faith in some something, you know, a higher power or the universe, or it had to be about quantum physics, which I certainly, you know, am not qualified to understand deeply, that's okay. But it made me feel like I'm not part of this story of creating success. And 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 personally, it works better for me to feel like I am. And what I was really surprised by is how many people in my real life who aren't scientists at all said, I've always been interested in manifestation, but now that I understand how it works in the brain, I'm actually going to do the things like make the action board or, you know, set set the goal and work towards it that I always read about, but never actually acted on before. I think that's a beautiful phrase. You set a goal and you work towards it, but what you are clearly stating if I got right, and please feel free to correct me, mm -hmm. is that if you're tapping into the power of manifestation, you are just tapping into what is the most effective way to go about that process. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And it, and it kind of marries up very nicely with the brain science, which is that the brain is a small organ if you look at you know it, it in proportion to your body size, but it's very energy hungry. So it uses up 20, 30, 20 to 30% of the breakdown products of what we eat each day. When we're asleep, it's using up 20% of what we've eaten that day. So it likes to always choose the path of least resistance. It's very, it likes to be efficient. So therefore being you know, efficient and effective in your real life in terms of what you do to achieve the things that you want makes sense to the brain. So that's already kind of started aligning quite nicely. And I was smiling internally when you said, oh, I'm gonna jump around a bit because in the brain, it's all about interconnection. So I hope this makes sense to the, to the audience and I'm sure the podcast will get edited beautifully. But for me, jumping around completely makes sense because it's all connected. And I'm sure as we draw to a conclusion, all of those threads will come together and hopefully people will have you know, really great insight, even if it sounded like we went from brain science to manifestation to, you know, like different topics. We're, we're weaving threads like yeah. the brain is weaving neurons totally. inside of neural pathways. Yeah. And there's a deep connection that's there that you explain mm -hmm. beautifully with that and manifestation. Mm -hmm. Now, one question about manifestation, is it that everybody, even the people who don't realize it, they're still tapping into the power of manifestation. They may not realize that they're actually manifesting things in their life that they say they don't want, but that their mind is completely preoccupied. Mm -hmm. Is that, how does that fit within your wheelhouse? Yeah, so like you said, it is a subject that has attracted skepticism in the past and, and you know, still does to some extent. 
And what I'm always amazed by is the small number of people that I see that I consider to be the biggest negative manifestors that I've ever like come across in my life. And I, I always think, and it's, and we've all been guilty of it to a certain extent. Oh, you know, that will never happen for me. Oh, that goal is a bit too big for, you know, let's, let's like take it down a notch kind of thing. Um, or worse than that, which is, you know, it's just my luck. Bad things always happen to me. No, nothing ever works out for me. As I said, in neuroplasticity, if you are continually saying and thinking those things, it's more likely to come true. Mm. If you're so powerful at manifesting that, imagine what could happen if you decided to say, that will work out for me. That will work out better than I even dreamed that it could. Mm. And I just invite people to try that for a day or a weekend or a week. Or I have a very close friend who is also an executive coach, but not particularly into manifestation, who one year said, I'm just going to say yes to everything that I would normally say no to. Mm. Um, you know, for me, sometimes learning to say no to things has been an important part of my journey. And I'll share something with you that I've I've never shared before, apart from with my close friends, which mm. is just from the sort of upbringing and education that I had. So, you know, you'll understand the expectation of first generation immigrant Indian parents. And then I was very fortunate, had a very privileged education, but it was very competitive. And, you know, I was absolutely expected to go to the best universities and be professional. And that does leave this little girl inside that always thinks she's never going to be good enough. Mm. And so I remember when I was filming my um, online program for MIT Sloan, I said to one of my best friends that, you know, it's it, it was super hard work. It was, I was in lockdown in the UK. So it was on a, you know, different time zone as well. And it was, you know, a, a sort of run of deadlines every few weeks to get it ready. And I remember saying to her, it's it's not perfect. It's not going to be good enough. I'm so stressed and there's just not enough time left to, to get it right. And she said to me, I have never seen you not knock the ball out of the park and beyond. And I said to her, this is the one time that's not going to happen. I'm absolutely <laughs> sure of it. And I think I made like my family's life quite miserable for a few weeks around that time. And then it came out and I, I did... I can't remember all of the like statistics now, but I mean, it was literally number two, the number two program, second only to the AI program at MIT. Wow. So, yeah. wow. It had a net promoter score of 98%. Mm. It had like over 200 people sign up for the first iteration. And for the first time in my life, I actually thought you cannot at this age keep saying nothing's going to be good enough. And then it turns out to be that good. Like you've got to make a change here. Mm. And so the next big project I took on was my podcast. And I didn't have a lot of expectation around it, something that I just really wanted to do and I had a great team around me. Um, but they also said, you know, it's brand new. So if we want to get kind of, you know, supporters on board, then it would be better if we can do that before it launches, just because once it launches, people will ask for analytics and it's just new. And I wasn't offended by that. I thought, you know, it's gonna take some time to grow. and. Um, quite quickly, but certainly by the end of season one, it had charted to number one in the UK and the US on life sciences on Apple podcasts. And for the first time in my life, I didn't say, I can't believe that happened. Mm. I said, I'm not surprised that happened. And that was a huge neuroplasticity change for me. So I still have to prove myself a bit by doing that again, because I've only done yeah. that once in my life. But um, it's things like that, like more intangible things like difficulty saying no, you know, not prioritizing yourself because your level of self-worth and deservingness are pivotal to manifestation. If you don't believe that you deserve something, you immediately make it less likely to happen because of every action that you portray in the outside world based on what you believe about yourself. Mm, that's so powerful. It really brings up this theme that I've heard you talk about and you write a little bit about in the book is that many people are not aware about how their early either childhood insecurities or early belief systems, they didn't choose to believe. Mm -hmm. They kind of just inherited from their environment. Mm -hmm. They don't realize how powerful these are and how these narratives shape what they pay attention to, mm. right? Um, 
how do some of those, from a neuroscientist perspective, mm-hmm. how do you want to help our audience think about the power of these early moments? And that even when we become adults, like it's like you're an adult now, you know that you have a track record, you have receipts about it, you teach other people about the <laughs> point of gratitude, and yet still these mm. early stories and ideas mm. have a hold over you. Mm-hmm. What's going on in the brain that that's the case? Um, well, there's several mechanisms that we could discuss here. So, But probably from the neuroscience point of view, the most fundamental one is that the longer that pathways have existed in your brain, the deeper they're buried, the more powerful effect they have on you and the less conscious you are of that. So the earlier, the earliest experiences, and that will tend to be about the family that you grew up in. And obviously there's concentric circles because then there's the community that you grew up in, the school that you went to and the, you know, the politics of the country that you grew up in and any major events that occurred sort of, you know, in your young childhood. But if we just take it down to the family, because obviously the adults in your family and also teachers and community leaders are very, very important for children whose brains are so impressionable. You only really need one really striking role model in your life to have a huge impact on you, both either, you know, positively or negatively. And so your survival depends on the love of your caregivers. Mm. And so you learn at a young age what is okay to do and what you shouldn't do to keep that safety and security around you. And I'm talking about things like the values that your family hold, um, the boundaries that are you know acceptable or not acceptable in your family, the secrets that are kept in your family, um, who you identify with, and that will have been put onto you as a child because you won't decide that by yourselves, yourself, but it'll be things like, oh, you're just like your mother or you're just like your uncle, you know, and that will happen. Or you were mentioning in your family, like we're a high achieving family. Mm-hmm. We have to do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a sort of uh, a few things like that that have a very, very strong impact early in life. And um, there's a whole other area that we could go into of, of epigenetics, which is a you know really quickly growing field, but we certainly know that what happens in the womb is um, we we know a lot more about. That's not epigenetics. We know that that is also very critical to what happens to you. Um, so, just at the most basic example, if a mother is stressed and she has high circulating levels of the stress hormone cortisol, that will of course affect the baby because they share the same blood supply. We know in animal experiments that pregnant mice that were um, given the smell of peppermint and given a mild electric shock at the same time, that when the baby mice were born, they were never given an electric shock, but they would have a stress response to the smell of peppermint. Mm. So that's the part about being in utero. And then we also know that now we know more about the fact that what happened to your parents throughout their lifetime and your grandparents and possibly even beyond that also has an effect on your neural wiring. So um, the most, so, so one thing that I find really interesting is that you don't inherit the genes that your parents were born with, you inherit the expression of their genes at the time of conception. Mm. Um, and further back than that, we know from Dutch famine disease and the Holocaust that there are switching on and switching off of the expression of certain genes that you know will affect you in in your life and that that can sometimes it can be good even if a bad thing happened like if a stressful thing happened it can make you more resilient or it can make you more prone to anxiety so even there there is a level of i don't know if choice is the right word but let's say maybe agency over how you use what you've been given to make the most of your, you know, the life that you've got now. And, and certainly, like you said, in adulthood, there are things that you can look back on and reframe. And, you know, in more popular psychology, these are known, uh, these things are known um, by phrases like reparenting or inner child work or mirror work, um, where you basically obviously accept what's happened to you in the past, but, but see if you can reframe some of the emotions around it or 
just so either reframe emotions or manage that memory in a way that allows you to move forward in a different way to how you have up until now. Yeah, I appreciate you going into that because I brought it up from the context of sometimes people feel like, well, I'm trying to manifest. I'm trying to put mm -hmm. attention on the things that I want to create in mm -hmm. my life, the things that I want to attract, the things that I want to bring in. And they don't often know if they're not paying attention to it that there might be still some background thoughts that mm -hmm. you have to push up against, mm -hmm. which by the way, everybody has. Of course, there's degrees of trauma that people have went through, mm -hmm. but everybody's gone through some version of an imprinting and mm -hmm. your parents were just doing the best that they could. They had yeah. their own imprinting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it wasn't even that they sat down and said, it's, you know, they didn't tell you to your face, like you're not good enough, right? They would say certain things and we would infer from those mm -hmm. situations. Some people did and my heart goes out to them have a parent that, you know, just to straight up say, you're, you're not good enough. So you go around constantly in your life, mm -hmm. even when you're trying to achieve, even when you're trying to manifest, all you can see is that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Yeah. I'm not good enough. So I think that when we start to become aware that these thoughts are there, as we begin to put some of our resources into action boarding, vision boarding, manifestation, really take advantage of the power of the brain, we can say, okay, great. That's an, that's not, that's not my, uh, it's funny when people believe everything that they think. Mm -hmm. Some of your thoughts are like popcorn. That's like your old high school coach or that's your elementary teacher who said you are you don't have good handwriting or you're not creative. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think at one point in time, one of your beliefs as an example was, I'm not creative. Yeah. What were some of the earliest experiences that you had that left that impression for you? Just as an example for our audience. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just say something before I go on to that, which I, has just come into my mind. Please, please, what you've jump just said. into it. Really important. So if you think about a pendulum swing of the <clears throat> formative experiences that you might have had as a child, and on, you know one side is extremely good, which may be you know, parents or teachers that have said, you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, and on the other extreme, there may be not something as obvious as you're not good enough, but it may just be something like, that's, that's not the kind of job that you could end up in. That's not going to work out for you. It's better for you to do something else. So those two things are very obvious. We often remember those things consciously. And even the bad things like that will never happen for you. Some of those things have spurred me on to achieve those things more because somebody told me that I couldn't do them. I think the most potentially dangerous, but also area with highest potential is the very middle of that pendulum swing mm. where there are small, what we would call perhaps like, you know, micro um, experiences that you may not even remember consciously that really affect what you still do in adulthood. So that's why it's really wor worth doing inner work like journaling or therapy or meditation to, to try to find out what it is that you're not conscious of that might be driving a lot of your behaviors. Mm. Um, so yeah, mine is a, a very classic example I found out once I started sharing it and that's something I'm a big fan of, you know, that there are lots of things that we hold secretly because there might be some shame around them and when we share them we tend to find out that a lot of people have you know had similar yeah, we think experience. we're the only person exactly and then we start sharing and then other people raise their hand well so my one which was that was you know it's, it's not like traumatic or anything but my art teacher at high school said that because i wasn't good at drawing that that meant i wasn't creative so i think i was about 15. i fully 100 percent believed that till i was at least 35 and that was okay because I did my science A-levels. I went to medical school. I became a doctor. It, you know, it wasn't that relevant to my life, but it was certainly a lingering thought. It was only actually when I was um, giving a lecture at Stanford at the D School, which is a, a really interesting concept where they have... It's a um, design school, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. design school, but they take people from all the different faculties like medicine and engineering and you know the arts... And they get them to sort of brainstorm and come up with ideas that you wouldn't come up with if you just stayed in your own. And I mentioned this to um, the guy that was running the D school at the time. And he said, well, that happened to me as well. And in fact, around our age group, there's a generation of people that believed they weren't creative because mm. at, at that time, being creative meant that you could paint or sing. Um, and it, it wasn't kind of a more expanded view of creativity that we have now. 
but but even then and that that then for me went hand in hand with the fact that my English teacher said to me you're so talented at acting that you should read English at Oxford and go to RADA and become an actress mm. and when I told my father he literally said over my dead body wow. and he said go to medical school first and then you can do whatever you like um but obviously, once you've gone to medical school, it's quite tough yeah, to give Indian that Yeah, Indian parents love to say that, <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's like interesting of how to make that pivot. Exactly. <laughs> Especially here in America, at least you guys have a little bit better of sort of a higher education program. Yeah. You're not ending up with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, you know, which is very common here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's interesting advice for sure. Yeah. And, you know, at that time, you you really didn't see many Asian people on, on even the small screen. Um, and... It's been so fascinating for me to see that change in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and so another thing that's really important in terms of manifestation and us overcoming some of these beliefs that we might hold about ourselves is giving ourselves examples of people that we identify with for whatever reason. It doesn't have to be actual skin color or anything like that, but that is somebody that feels like they're like you that's achieved something that you want to achieve. I mean, your own past ex successes are, are great things to you know write down, as I've said as well, so that when you're moving on to the next thing, you can say, here was something I didn't think I would achieve, but I did, so I know I can do it. If you really don't have an example of the specific thing that you're trying to achieve, then you know I could have looked at you or Rongan or Rupi and said, well, you know, they launched a really successful podcast, so you know, that should help me to believe that I can as well. It's possible for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, so in that in that area, there's four things that are important. So focusing on your own past successes, finding... The find, kids these days call them receipts. Are you aware they, of that? No, I heard you use that word. I didn't yeah, know. What, yeah. yeah. So they okay. call it receipts. It's okay. basically, you know, here's proof that you went through yeah. this, right? It's your... It's your record, just like you get a receipt for buying something. It's like, show me your receipts, which basically means like, hey, are you putting in the work? That's so cute. I love yeah. that. I'm going to take that that lingo on. Um, so if you don't have a receipt yourself, then looking for, you know, example of somebody like you that's, that's achieved that. Um, keeping your brain and body in good condition. So the usual basics that I speak about, like sleep and diet and exercise. Um, and then... The last one, which is, you know, coming full circle to the question that you first posed is, is um, dealing with that voice in your head that tells you that you can't do it. And mm. wherever that's coming from, whether it's your parents, your teachers, your, you know, the past. Um, and for that, I suggest people create their own personalized affirmation or mantra. So underneath every thought that we hold about ourselves is a belief that we're often not fully conscious of so you need to do the work through self-reflection of digging under the thought the recurring thought that you may have about something specific finding out what it is that you believe about yourself that's driving that thought and then create a statement that is the opposite of that belief and just one clarification these are recurrent thoughts so like a negative recurrent thought or sort of like a weighty like like it's kind of like it doesn't have a positive yeah. Uh, aspect to it. It's sort of negative or maybe even slightly leaning neutral negative. Is that what you Something mean? Something that's holding you back. Something that's holding you back. Yeah. Okay, got it. And neuroplasticity really is boosted by repetition and emotional intensity. So either a recurring thought or like you said, a weighty thought. Mm -hmm. um, and so th this comes from, from Buddhism as well as neuroplasticity, which is that to replace an, a thought that you don't desire with a thought that you do desire or that's going to help you to move forward or that's going to unblock, you know, what's not been happening up until now. So, you know, if, if it's something like, I'll just use a really, really common one, which is, you know, I'm not good enough, then you would change that to um, something quite bold. So not, you know, I'm not a fan really of that phrase, I'm enough, because I think everybody is it. Is, is enough and needs to be like more, you know, feel that they're more than that. So it'd be something like, this is perfect for me. I'm exactly right for this. I'm more than good enough for that. You know, and you just, every time you, the doubt creeps in, you replace it with that thought. And so from a neuroscientist perspective, 
that works, right? Is are, There's research behind it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you've heard people anecdotally. I remember people kind of talking to that when I first got into the world of sort of positivity culture, mm -hmm. reading about Tony Robbins or this person mm -hmm. or that person when I was early in college. But you're saying that that is backed up through the research, that it actually is useful for the brain to have something else to latch onto that creates a different future. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Remember what I said about how energy efficient the brain is? Mm -hmm. So basically, if a thought has been recurring or, or holds a strong emotional intensity, then it's probably a, a lot, it's aligned with a neural pathway that's probably made up of lots of neurons that have connected up together. And when a pathway in the brain is thicker, it's easier for the chemical and electrical signals to pass down that pathway. So by, and, and what's important to know in the brain is that you can't undo a neural pathway in the brain. The only thing you can do is overwrite it. Mm. So to create a pathway that is more energy efficient than the one that's already there. So by continually interrupting the negative thought and replacing it with the positive one, you will eventually get to the point where that pathway is stronger than the original one. I think I just had an aha moment and, and it might be misguided, but you're going to correct me, right? That's why you're the expert and I'm the interviewer here. The aha moment that I had is that so many times I see people wanting to focus on the negative aspect of why they are the way they are, mm -hmm. right? Which, which I'm sure there can be benefits. Obviously, you need to initially look at something, but it could be they want to use their thought power to say, you know, and it's a reoccurring thought, like, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. Like, why do I keep on doing things this mm. way, right? Why do I keep on doing the same pattern? Mm -hmm. And that feels like you're just riding down that pathway mm -hmm. again and again and again when you're using that phrase instead of a little bit of gentleness mm -hmm. that's there, which is tough. It takes practice, mm. but going to something else, like going to another mm. thought that's positive mm. versus people. I think this might even go back to the dopamine connection is that some people are addicted to beating themselves up. Mm. Do you ever see that out there? That people want to beat themselves up and say, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. I do that. I always do that. All right. I, I did that again. I just like... There's an addiction to wanting to do a little bit of self-harm. Is that a dopamine thing? So so for, first of all, all of that language, I'm so stupid, why do I keep doing that, is you know things that we all need to work on. So from what I've just shared with you, I would immediately try to change that to, I can be smarter than this, I don't always do that, or I can change myself to not always doing that you know so that's the start or i'm showing up the best that i can and i'm working on even being better some version like yeah. if, if whatever feels true to you but is still towards the positive yeah and but you still have to have awareness to be able to do mm -hmm. that in the first place mm -hmm. it's you know it's like you said some people are in the loop of i'm so stupid this always keeps happening to me um and so it will be that will be a very complex mechanism in the brain made up of the whole array of neurotransmitters. Everything, beliefs, everything, all kind of intersecting. Which together. are all, you know, they're all um, underpinned by different neurotransmitters. But the way that it works is, um, so your amygdala is an almond-shaped object deep in the limbic system, which is the um, seat of your most basic primal emotions. Some people call it the first brain sometimes. Do you think of it that way? Um We've kind like of, our earliest brain, we've kind of moved beyond that. Yeah, yeah, we've kind of moved beyond that. It used to be called the reptilian brain, but, um, and there are kind of, it's it's easy to think of the brain in, in like sort of three sections that have grown around each other, but our understanding of the brain is much more sophisticated now. So we like to think of it as systems that interact with each other mm -hmm. that are underpinned by these different neurotransmitters. And, you know, the brain is just a lot more complex than than that, that, which we believed for a very long time. And it was only when we got scanning technologies that we understood it a bit differently. Um, so yeah, the amygdala is part of the limbic system. And it's, it's to do with, it's, that's where our emotions arise from in the first place. And then there's a whole kind of cascade system of um, biofeedback loops and stuff that affect how they, you know, pan out in the brain and the body. And then the hippocampus, also part of the limbic system, is where our memories are formed and stored. So those two parts of the brain interact with each other a lot because obviously we lay down memories that are associated with emotions. And when 
again, going back to what I said about when we're under stress, not feeling good about ourselves, that we have higher levels of cortisol, the stress hormone. When the brain detects that levels of cortisol are, are higher than they should be and they're staying high, one of the things it will do to keep you safe is that the amygdala and the hippocampus will get together and dredge up every bad memory of you having failed at something, telling you why you shouldn't take a risk and you know go out there and try to make it better, telling you that you're stupid, that this will always happen to you, that you can't change it. Because if in that mode, let's say I was feeling like that this morning and then I came here to record the podcast with you, it probably wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't give my best performance. You'd be cautious, um, you'd be worried about saying stuff, you'd be second guessing yourself. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't want to share per as much personal information because I would think that that could lead to me being criticized or ridiculed or humiliated. So it basically makes you hold back on, in a way, I feel like in that mode, the brain, when you need it the most, doesn't give you the things that can really help you. So for example, let's say I'd had a bad day today and I thought, well, I don't, I've never met Drew before. So I'm obviously not going to tell him like what's happened this morning because then he'll just think I'm a bad podcast guest. You know, that's the way the brain will start help, you know, like justifying. Yeah. But if that had happened and I came here and I said, look, Drew, you've heard me on podcast before. You know what I'm capable of. I've just had this, you know, really unexpected bad morning. How can we work together to make sure that this interview comes out the best that it possibly can? with you knowing that that's what's happened in the background mm. that would you know completely change it yeah um so it's things it's it's understanding that sometimes when we feel really under pressure our brain isn't necessarily helping us and the more work that we have done when things are you know good or all right the more we can have access to the awareness, which is so important in the moment to be able to override this potential safety mechanism of the brain that's telling you, for actually survival reasons, that's telling you that you're stupid, that you shouldn't take a risk, that things will go wrong. Do you think that that's the brain's version of, you know, also for some people it's fight and flight, but for mm -hmm. other people it's maybe, is, the, is it the brain's version of pulling into the stress response of freeze? Like, do you think that sometimes comes in? You know, we have fight or flight, mm -hmm. but then we also have freeze that some people just play dead when they feel like, maybe they're not literally playing dead like the way that an animal, animals play dead, right? Mm -hmm. When they're being hunted and other things. And mm -hmm. that's some ways, there's a ton of videos on this on YouTube mm -hmm. and Instagram of an animal plays dead for a little while. The predator that was chasing it kind of gets distracted for a second because it thinks that it made the kill. And then the animal is able to dart off, mm -hmm. right? The rabbit or whatever. Do... Is, is part of us sort of tensing up in a moment, is that also tapping into that freeze response? Yeah, so basically fright is the um, thing that triggers us. In response to fright, we can either take flight, which is literally run away, or we can fight. Um, let's use a workplace scenario. That would kind of mean that you might yell at your boss or actually physically assault them, which you can't really do. So that's why in the modern day, we're more likely to freeze. And I love this example of animals playing dead. It's a really great kind of analogy for it, but we wouldn't obviously physically do that, but we would right. try to go under the radar. Mm. Let's hope that my boss doesn't notice me and picks on my team member instead because I'm not getting anything done at the moment kind of you know scenario. Or let's shut down and not bring up the things that could be actually helpful yeah. for people to work through. Exactly. It's like, I don't wanna get beaten up, so let me just shut down in yeah. this moment. Yeah, and, and like I said, the blood flow in your brain is literally shutting down. Mm. It's going down to the survival centers so that you are able to get up in the morning, get dressed, look smart enough, go to work and sit at your desk, but you're not able to be productive, collaborative, creative, have healthy conflict, all of those things actually can, you know, make things much, much better. So I'm, if I'm connecting the dots for myself correctly, what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that it's what we do when times are good, the training mm -hmm. that we do, mm -hmm. having the affirmation, mm -hmm. diet, which you've mentioned previously, mm -hmm. uh, breathing, which is also a way to, you know, continuously keep the blood flow high mm -hmm. to the brain. And all the other things you talk about, we'll tease some of those out in a minute. Mm -hmm. It's the things that we do when times are good and having the 
the intent and the practice, I don't want to use the word willpower, but making it a priority Mm -hmm. when times are good, that supports us in these moments when times are bad. Is that accurate? I have never been formally taught that in medicine or neuroscience, but I have certainly found that to be true in my real life um, several times. Um, I will quote a piece of research from Amishi Jha that balances that view out a little bit. So when she was um, working with the US Marines on mindfulness-based resilience training, they had a group that was supposed to be practicing mindfulness before going to the battle zone and a control group that weren't practicing. But in the group who were supposed to be doing X minutes of meditation a day, there were some skeptics and they just didn't do it. And so they went with their group to the battle zone and very quickly noticed that the colleagues who had been meditating could sleep at night, even though there was gunfire going on all night, that the colleagues who'd done meditation weren't sweating or getting palpitations like they were. So they went to the researchers and said, okay, I didn't do what I said I've been doing for the last month, but I want to start now, please, can you like help me? And they said, of course, we can help you to like start this meditation program, but we cannot promise that it's it's suddenly gonna help you now that you're in the battle zone. And what was really surprising was that it had a very, very quick effect, a positive effect on people. So even the people who hadn't done meditation in preparation for battle got benefits like in a matter of days. So I don't want people to feel like, oh, well, I haven't been meditating for years and, you know, journaling and I don't always eat super healthy, so I'm doomed. Um, I, I always say the best time to plant an acorn was 200 years ago, but the second best time is now. (laughs) (laughs) Ghosts are related to neural pathways that have been there for so long in your brain that you're not even aware that they are there. So the earlier in childhood that a neural pathway formed and kind of became strong, the more of a ghost it is. And these are formed by things like um, the boundaries that your family had, you know, so if some people have very like strict families and some people have very like open homes where people could just drop by any time and um, stay over or whatever. The values that you're, you know, that were held in your, when I say family, I mean the environment that you grew up in, any secrets, um, any role identifications. So this can sometimes be things like, oh, you're just like your father, or it could be things like, you know, you're the kind of go between messenger and the family, you know, whatever. So there's a lot of things that create these very, very old, deeply embedded neural pathways. And so for such a variety of complex reasons, any of us could think that's never gonna work out for me. My number one tip for overcoming that is obviously address anything that's like an obvious um, reason that you might think that, and that could be in therapy or through journaling. But um, when you have a thought like that, it's underpinned by a belief about yourself and it's usually to do with deservingness. So trying to work out specifically what that is for you and then creating a positive affirmation that's the opposite of that statement. So let's say you're thinking, stop kidding yourself, that's not gonna happen for you. And it's because you repeatedly watched your one of your parents say that they were going to achieve something, but then fail over and over again. And that's what you witnessed as a child. So your belief could be something like, failure happens more than success. So what you'd have to make your positive affirmation is success happens more than failure. Now, at first that might seem like you're not even telling the truth, but it has to be quite a bold statement. So even if it doesn't feel true right now, every time you think failure happens more than success, you have to say out loud or write down or in your mind, success happens more than failure. And you need to keep repeating that until that becomes more of a natural thought process for you. Mm. Were there any ghosts that you created a manifestation around, or uh, sorry, uh, affirmation around that were helpful in your journey of 
stepping more into your creative ability to communicate the neuroscience? I think this, the one that came up that was re that really had to change for me, that was big for me, and I'm sure has contributed to the um, creative story, was that everything had to be perfect. So, you know, I had to get 10 out of 10 on the spelling test. And if I didn't, I was questioned about why I got one thing wrong um, as, as a kid. And so an affirmation that I, I made when I changed my career um, was let your true self shine through. And it's not necessarily related to that everything had to be perfect, but, you know, there are a few reasons that those sort of themes came up. So I used that one, let your, self, your true self shine through for quite a while until I became, that became very natural for me. Um, and then I, you know, I struggled with things like good enough is, is okay. You know, I, I could not really get my head around that for a very long time. Um, and what I realized was that the behavior that was panning out for me was I had such high expectations, everything had to be perfect. So, that, and then I thought, well, it's not going to be perfect. So you know, I was just looking out for everything that was like less than perfect or wrong. And then I realized that actually usually in the end, whether it's perfect or not is irrelevant. I do quite a good job of most of the things that I do and I'm proud of them afterwards, but I've caused myself so much stress in the run up to it. And, you know, the closest people around me maybe felt some of that stress too, that that really just wasn't worth it. And I gave myself the the data and the evidence that usually the projects that I pay my attention to turn out really well. So I kind of just learned to drop the stress that around perfection that was coming with that. Um, and, you know, I think a big learning that I had as well is that things don't always pan out how you plan. So becoming more flexible and open and spontaneous was important. And I think both of those things have definitely contributed to being more creative because in creativity, there is no such thing as perfection and you do have to be flexible and spontaneous. I love how you said that, you know, things don't always go according to plan. And for some people that is their sort of negative mantra that keeps them from trying new things. Mm -hmm. And I just had this insight that even I had a version of that mm -hmm. when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And as I was starting my entrepreneurial journey, it was the switch of, well, things don't always work out, which was said in a negative way mm. to prevent me from trying things. Mm -hmm. And that's switching to, you know, sometimes things don't work out and that can be a great opportunity. Because mm. when things don't work out, it's a test, it's an experimentation. Mm -hmm. And that is all more information about a different way to potentially go about stuff. I love when things don't work out in business because that's, more information for us to find a different way of going about things that one of those next ventures will end up working out and be very successful. Yeah. I mean, as a serial entrepreneur like you, that's like quite an obvious in a way, just like very tangible. But what I want to put behind that, that I'm sure you have examples of as well, is that it's the way that you deal with that that's the actual test. Right. Because something can not go as planned and you could waste months or years dwelling on that mm. or you could learn through neuroplasticity to put that behind you as quickly as possible and move on to the next potential option and that's definitely been a big learning for me as well you know and it's come from not being able to let go of things that haven't panned out the way that I wanted them to and then really looking back and taking stock and realizing okay that that happened anyway whatever it was that actually happened that wasn't going to change but the amount of time that I wasted not being able to come to terms with that, that was actually the mistake that I made. Mm, great reminder. Okay, next question here. On my path to manifesting my dreams, what evidence should I be looking for to know that I'm headed in the right direction? Are there clues that I should be paying attention to along the journey? That's a really nice question. I wish I had a bit more of a like specific example because I want to say that there are clues, but it's quite hard to say what they might be if I don't know, you know, what necessary. So let's, okay, let's just say generally if you're trying to manifest things. Let's say somebody wants to find a new job and change careers mm. and they feel very nervous about it, but they are starting to create their action board 
-hmm. they're imagining and maybe they don't even know what career they want to shift to. I mean, you've gone through this in a way yourself Mm -hmm. and they imagine themselves being more creative, hanging out with interesting people, learning, working in a different environment, maybe traveling, speaking on stage or communicating something. Let's use that example, right? Yeah. And I think that's a great example. Um, And for other things as well, a question you could ask yourself is, am I making progress, however small, towards that thing on a regular basis? Um, I think if you find that you're plateauing or going backwards, then you might need to like, you know, rethink. Um, But I want to go back to the six principles in my book and, and say that like, make sure that it feels like these are are valid in in your journey. So the first one is abundance, which is based on the negative gearing in the brain of um, avoiding loss. So the balance of being nervous and excited is a good sign. For for me personally, I know that that's a sweet spot for me. But if you're way more nervous than you are excited, you might want to kind of journal about that and see just what the facts are around how likely this, you know, manifestation is, how realistic it is within your, you know, your power to influence it. And then magnetic desire is really important because often people say that they want things because that's what all their friends are doing or that's what society expects. And magnetic desire is something that you want so strongly that you are willing to go through the time that it might take or the effort that it might take. And you can't not keep moving towards it. Like you don't have an option. So I think that's a really important one. And it doesn't even matter whether other people want it or not. You know you want it. Yeah. And you know, maybe particularly if it's not in the norm or the flow, but it's like very, very special to you, then I think that's actually maybe even a better sign. Um, And then, you know, manifestation is what are the things that you're doing, whether it's through your thoughts or actions in the real world that are going to bring that thing to reality? You know, so I guess the question here is how much can you do? How much can you influence this? Um, And, you know, that may include asking for help. So it may be that somebody or something else can influence it too, but you've, you've still got to ask for that help. And then patience, which I mentioned before, which is that, that you don't give up because, you know, because it's taking too long. Um, so, you know, continuing to be motivated towards that goal, even if it feels like nothing's happening at times, which that, you know, can happen. And then harmony and universal connection kind of go together in that the thing you're trying to manifest isn't taking away resources from someone else. You know, it's not, it's not creating scarcity. It's part of the whole general abundance that, you know, we want to sort of foster in the world. Um, yeah, I would say you've got to be really practical about it and go back to those things and and help use those six kind of questions to ask yourself if you can see clues in your life. Mm, That's powerful. Okay, this one's a little bit of an interesting question. (laughs) Dr. Tara, after finding your content on YouTube, YouTube, I've gone down the rabbit hole on law of attraction and I'm not exactly sure what advice is real. Of course, yours. And what other advice is, quote unquote, BS? <laughs> um, are there things that I should be wary of as I continue to go down the path of the law of attraction and manifestation that you feel isn't supported by the science? So I think there is an element of if some things work for you, you may not need to know the science or if there is science behind it. So. For some people, there are just some things that work, and I'm not against that at all. But the reason that I wrote my book is because I wanted to see an explanation of the law of attraction that was based on cognitive science, which is basically the power of your mind, because A, I needed evidence as a scientist, but B, I wanted to feel the agency of influencing my own future and not relying on some external force that was intangible to me. So again, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying it's wrong to think that the universe is trying to help you or that there are vibrations or frequencies that attract things into your life. I do think 
you have to be a kind, loving, grateful person for good things to happen to you. And that if you're constantly saying, um, that's not going to work out for me, that's probably going to be true. Um, but I think that when you use psychology and neuroscience to explain that the way that you think, the things that you believe, the actions that you take in the world, um, impact your relationships, impact your confidence in taking healthy risks, impact your ability to move towards your goals. That is very understandable and is supported by science. So I would take that as the backbone of the way that you look at the law of attraction. And maybe if there are some things around that that can't necessarily be explained by science, that's okay. Mm. So separating out that if you come across advice if it works for you, awesome. And if it's not supported, just kind of keep that in mind. Like if you're trusting another quote unquote expert, just be mindful of that. It could work. It may not work, but don't kid yourself is part what I'm, partly what I'm hearing. Yeah. And for that reason, I don't even really love the word advice. Um, I think, you know, if it's like an explanation or a philosophy, then you can, you know, read it or try it. But you know, and I do, I do, it's really crystallizing for me actually that the reason I had to write the book with the cognitive science was that it's got to come back to yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to see evidence that you made this happen and not rely on a guru or an expert or a, you know, a more intangible external force. So that perfect into the next question, when individuals are implementing the practices in your book, The Source, mm -hmm. What are the top areas that you see them get tripped up if they're new to this world? Mm -hmm. So the top one is giving up because it's taking longer than you thought it would. That's number one. Yeah. So that falls for me under the six ways of thinking, which are logic, emotion, physicality, motivation, intuition, and creativity. That falls under the motivation one. And I just, I have this image, I think it's like seared onto my brain of a man that's digging for gold and he's digging this horizontal tunnel and we can see that the bag of gold is like a few feet away, but he's been digging for so many feet and he's tired and so he gives up. Now, when it's your own life, you can't see where that bag of gold is. You can't see how close it is necessarily, but that time where you're so close but you want to give up is a real test of your own resilience, mental resilience. Um, so building up that mental resilience and being willing to be the person that waits for just that little bit longer than you know the next person or your old self, I think is really important. Um, not listening to your intuition, and that can be for two reasons. That can be partly because you just haven't honed your intuition to the point where you feel it's a really valuable skill. And the other one can be because it's in conflict with your logic, your emotion. So a classic example is towards the end of a relationship, there are usually so many red flags, but people will try to hold on. Um, and then as soon as it's over, they'll look back and think, why didn't I leave several months ago? So that kind of thing where your gut is absolutely telling you that this relationship is over, but you will give yourself so many reasons to stay and try again. And you know, you sort of, you smiled. I think everybody's got an example of that in their life. So apply that to other scenarios as well, like maybe in your work or in something that you're doing towards your physical fitness or your, you know, your health in general. What What is that period where you're not listening to your gut? Because actually listening to your gut is is super important. And if you learn how to do that well, it can be a real game changer for all of this. Mm, powerful. Uh in our last podcast, you detailed out why you call it an action board. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, people look at, as, look at it as a vision board mm -hmm. and you say action board because you want people to take action. So this next question here goes right into that, which is that, so I've put my action board together and I am, I've put it in a place where I can see it. Mm -hmm. They didn't write that, but that's kind of what I'm extrapolating from this question. Mm -hmm. So I've put my action board together. I've put it in a place where I can be reminded of it daily. What happens when I am afraid to take action towards it? Any best advice on overcoming and facing fear 
that gets in the way of the action that's needed to fulfill my action board. Yeah, I actually want to take that back a stage because something I hear quite often is that people have selected all the images, laid them out on the board, but haven't glued them down yet. Mm. And I think this is, this person's obviously gone further, which is great, but it's kind of on the same spectrum. Usually it comes back to a feeling of lack of deserving of the of the image, so the thing that you want. And what I will say from a neuroscience point of view is that fear and uncertainty are actually the worst state for your brain to be in. If you take a step forward, what you find out quite quickly is that even if something doesn't work out, that feeling is less bad for your brain than the fear of uncertainty. Mm. The fear and the holding on to fear is scarier. Mm. That classic quote, who was it? One of the presidents, or maybe it was Winston Churchill, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Mm. Who is that? Is that Winston Churchill? I think Churchill? it's Winston Churchill, yeah. If we could fact check me, Tessa, so I don't <laughs> get some hate mail later on <laughs> from my history teachers in uh, high school. Um, but yeah, it is so true. How many of us have this feeling in our life that this simple little action, it just took one email being sent, mm. one phone call, mm. and we made it into so much of a bigger deal in our head than it was when we actually ended up having to go through it. Yeah, and if you've got a few examples of that in your life, then that's that's great, it's really helpful. And I remember when I first read Who Moved My Cheese, there's one of the question on one of the pages is what would you do if you weren't afraid? And I find myself asking myself that question sometimes. So I, I don't put myself in a position of you have to do this. I just say, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? And I write it down in my journal. And usually then you, you, know, you see the first step to what you can do. I love that. There's a sister question to that question that I've stolen from the author, podcaster, life hack expert, Tim Ferriss. Mm -hmm. And he asks himself a question that he's talked a lot about and he encourages his listeners to do it. He says, what would it look like if it was easy? Oh, yeah, that's nice. So often we think that this thing that we want to make progress on in our life has to be hard. We've almost manifested hardship mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. But what would it look like if it was easy? And even if it's still tough, simply asking that question, I know for me, removes a lot of the stress around this thing that I want to make progress on, mm -hmm. I might want to achieve. And at least as a mental thought experiment, that puts me in a place to even imagine that it doesn't have to be hard. And what would that look like? What would it look like if that was easy? Yeah, and I think this relates also to procrastination about just deadlines and tasks. You know, so it's the same kind of field, which is, okay, you're not taking a step, an action towards your like action board goals, but it's not really that different to why you procrastinate over, you know, a document or an interview or something like that. And it is because you think it's going to be much harder than it is. And so I have so many examples of where I finally get around to something at the last moment. And then I think, oh, that didn't take as long as I thought, or it wasn't as hard as I thought. Um, and I have a kind of, let's say a cousin question to, to the two that we've already said, which is what would it feel like if I get the best possible result in this scenario? Mm. Um, and once you kind of just imagine that, and then you go into the scenario, you go in like so much more willingly without the fear. I love that question because part of what you're doing, or at least part of what I'm understanding that you're saying that you're doing is you're priming the brain to expect good rather than to expect the worst. Yeah. Why is that so important? Give us a reminder. Because it's a natural survival mechanism in our brain to expect the worst, to protect ourselves from you know, potential bad consequences. But particularly in the modern world, the proportion of how often we think that's gonna be a bad outcome and what actually is, is it's skewed, it's not correct. So by priming your brain more towards the trust and excitement, getting the bonding hormone going, you feel better. And the fact is that your fear of how bad the outcome could be wasn't correct in the first place anyway. So it aligns more with reality. It's just interesting, I think, who, what kind of friends you make at, you know, in adulthood that's different to the ones that you make in childhood. But the ones in childhood have very similar values and you have lots of memories with them, but they may be doing like very, very different things to, to you. And the ones that you meet later, especially after a significant career change, might have just more in common with the person that you are now. But 
for me, it's really, really important that they are, you know, that we're all people that support each other, that absolutely want the best for each other, that like would do anything for each other and that I could tell anything to. Um, Another reminder, your friends and your core group is a reminder that the world is safe, you know, kind of goes yeah. back to that Albert Einstein quote, yeah, which yeah. I'll paraphrase here. But I think he said that the most important question that a human being can ask himself is that is the world, the universe, a force for good? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or is it a force for evil? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think not only do I personally think that is so important, but when we look at, you know, you're asking me what are the factors that contribute to manifestation? Let's just, because they're similar, but in a way kind of more vital are the factors that contribute to successful aging and longevity. Mm. Um, and like in a healthy, you know, the best possible way. And those are sleep, like I mentioned already. Um, and I'm going to say hydration quite sort of higher up than I normally would just because for the chemical and electrical signals to pass along the neural pathways, you've got to be adequately hydrated. So it's just such a basic one. Um, and then obviously exercise because oxygenation of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so these are factors that contribute to manifestation, but also successful aging. And then diet and for, for diet, like let's just assume that people know the basics that you eat a healthy, diverse, mostly plant-based diet. Above that, you need to focus on eating as many dark foods as you can. So the dark skinned foods, and that includes coffee for your mother-in-law, who I know is <laughs> um, but just not at the wrong times. Um, so, you know, dark berries, dark chocolate, purple sprouting broccoli, um, eggplant. The polyphenols in the, that skin contributes to neurogenesis, which is the growth of new nerve cells. So not, not just the connection of existing ones. Um, and then the factor that is up there for, you know, people staying healthy in old age is positive, meaningful social relationships. Mm. And so that must not be underestimated. And and you've just reminded me through this conversation how vital that is to manifestation. Because if everywhere that I looked or spoke, people said, don't be silly, Tara. That's not going to work. Why are you doing that? Um and a lot of people live in that reality. Yeah, then, you know, I might stop doing it. I might be ashamed to talk about it. I might not want to share my accomplishments. Um, I think it's really important to be humble. But, you know, part of the joy of life for yourself is to be able to give that inspiration to other people of like, look, I said this is what I was going to do and it's happened and I'm so grateful. I think one important point, because I would tell you that that core aspect of loneliness that mm. the world is suffering from mm. right now. Mm. There's an increasing number every year of people who feel that even if they have a lot of friends or people that they know, mm -hmm. a lot of family, there's people that feel, I don't have people in my life that truly understand and get who I am, mm. right? That number's kind of seen, at least from the data that I've been seeing, kind of mm -hmm. ticked up um, and has been ticking up. And I think that for those people in that category, just one thing I'd like to add is that if you've ever had somebody in your life even when you were younger, or maybe it was in university, or maybe, um, you know, just somebody. It might take a little bit of work, depending on what age that you met them in, but see if you can get back in touch with that person. And even on the topic of manifestation, can you set up, I literally call it with friends, I'll say, you know what, I missed you, right? And by the way, how mm. good does it feel when somebody tells you, like, I missed you, mm. especially if they haven't talked to in a little while. And by the way, guys mm. who are listening, guys can say that to other guys, right? <laughs> yeah. And you don't have to be worried about that. So you know what? I really missed talking with you. We mm. had some really incredible times. How do you feel about putting a monthly check-in on the calendar? And we can just check in on each other's goals and dreams and what we're working on in life. Mm. If you've ever had one person, but you don't feel like you have that person now, reach out to that old person and see if a monthly check-in or something can be a way to at least keep some of that energy in your life. And then before you know it, you'll probably add in a second, third, fourth person. And mm -hmm. now you're surrounded by people who are rooting for your success. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And funnily enough, some like people from way back have come back into my life recently. And when I look at the messages, it's just, it's, it's interesting because you don't know how much people have changed over that time. But the messages are just all like, I'm so happy you're back in my life. I love you so much. I've thought of you over the years. And um, of course, I'll pass a message on to that friend that I'm still in touch with. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's oxytocin boosting. And I just would like to add to this as a human, 
not just a neuroscientist, that you don't have to check in on your monthly goals. You can just check in yeah, and like laugh about whatever, something whatever silly, you know. Yes. Yeah. No, thank you for adding that in. That's very important. It could just be an opportunity to say hi, hmm. hello, tell me what's going on in your life, yeah. right? Give me the latest. Or and- tell me like something really embarrassing that you did so I can just sure. laugh at you. you know? Anything, <laughs> yeah, anything. Exactly. Whatever way you guys connect, <laughs> Yeah. right? Whatever way you guys connect. You know, I want to go back to this idea of, I think a lot of people would be surprised that from a manifestation standpoint, that you were listing a lot of things that were about taking better care of the body, right? Mm -hmm. I often like to ask the opposite version of that question just Mm -hmm. to really drive that point home. What happens when we don't take care of our body? Mm -hmm. How does that impact manifestation? So you already went into a little bit of a deep dive on sleep, Mm -hmm. but if we are not taking care of our diet and getting you know, adequate levels of protein in our diet, adequate levels of diversity of the rainbow and fiber that comes from eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. Mm. You know, how does that affect our ability to manifest and create our goals and dreams in life? Yeah, it's a very simple answer. So manifestation is a higher function. It's not a survival function. It's a You know, I I have actually been challenged on it by people saying, isn't that a luxury for people that have, you know, the basics that they need in life? So. um, And to that, you would say yes? So, no. Uh, What I've said there is being very respectful of the fact that some people have much harder lives than others. I still hope and believe that everybody could make their life a little bit better if there was a little room for manifestation on top of the basics. And I've always tried to be very diplomatic about that because I realized, you know, there's a whole spectrum of of lives that people have. I had a guest on my podcast who, when I said that to her, actually, it was like paused for dramatic effect and said, manifestation is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Mm. And that changed it for me, you know, so that was great to have someone be so bold about that. But so given that it is a higher function, What I would say is that if you're compromised in any way, tired, hungry, dehydrated, inflamed, uh, stressed. Sedentary. Anything like that, then that's the priority for your brain and your body to heal that. It's not gonna be manifesting if it's got all that to deal with. (laughs) So if the gap is, is there any compromise in your body? If there's compromise in your brain or your body, that's what your body's gonna focus on. Once you're just at least neutral, then you can do manifestation. Mm, that's a powerful answer. Thank you for driving that home. I really think that like that connects the dots for a lot of people. Yeah. I want to ask you a question that I hear often that comes up in the topic of manifestation. And it's a question that people say, well, what if I don't know what I want? Mm. I'm sure you've heard this before. For somebody who's listening today, who's like, I believe in this. I think it's amazing. My challenge is not coming up with an action board. My challenge is not sort of doing the work. I want to put in the work. I want to take care of my body and I'm doing good at that. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what I want in life. In fact, I feel confused and maybe Mm -hmm. even a little bit conflicted Mm -hmm. as to what I should be going for. Mm -hmm. How do you help that person navigate? I do get that question on DM sometimes, not too often, but sometimes enough that I've had to think about it. So what I usually say at first to the person is maybe tackle it by thinking, how would I like my life to feel? And then... What I like add in that's more specific than that is two specific, two kinds of things. In the book, I actually start it by saying, has your life panned out exactly how you always dreamed it would? And if not, then manifestation is, you know, a a potential channel for you. The other thing is, at what stages in your life did you know what you wanted? Or what were the things that you wanted when there were times of more certainty? And then if that's not enough to kind of start the thought process going, then just journaling in general is the way to start untangling that confusion and conflict and lack of knowing. Mm. Could it also be that people can just get started with what they have right now and they can always add to it later on? I'll give you an example in my life Mm -hmm. is that when I got clear, a big driver for me in my life has been, okay, how do I figure out to create a situation that I can work with my family and friends. That was Mm -hmm. a big motivator for me, right? And then I found out that, okay, if you get a traditional job, you 
can't necessarily be hiring your family and friends. In fact, that's looked upon, <laughs> let's look down yeah. upon is even if you're, especially if you're a manager, you got to pursue the path of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, I have no idea about business. I have no idea what I want to do. I've been studying computer science over here, you know, following that sort of Indian path of, you know, a secure job and profession. I said, okay, I don't know what I want to do, but I know the feeling that I want. Oh. I want to be with my family and friends working on interesting projects. Yeah. Okay, what is the feeling? Literally, yeah. my first vision board was like this. Oh. Okay, we're, we're traveling together. We're a small team that's working on interesting projects. Mm -hmm. What projects? I don't know yet, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what we're going to be doing, hmm. right? We are having interesting conversation, but our world is a little bit of a blend of profession, but also personal. So if we want to, you know, take off in the middle of the day because we're going to go celebrate somebody's birthday or, mm -hmm. you know, talk about some big win in our lives mm -hmm. or whatever, I saw that blending in. And I would have different imagery. Sometimes I would write on different words onto mm -hmm. my vision board of what I would what I would want, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I think the unique thing was I didn't put too much pressure mm -hmm. on myself mm -hmm. of needing to know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you said that because it kind of validates what I've been saying to people about how would you want your life to feel? Because I don't always get to know the end result of those stories of, you know, people that DM me. So the fact that you went with a feeling and that's been really positive is great for me to hear. And, and I'll also share that, you know, I... I do an action board annually, but I have always really struggled to do like a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. I've never done that. And I always used to think I just, I can't for some reason. But at some point I realized that if you, and I, you know, I am a planner. I'm not that spontaneous. I like everything to be in order. I don't think you wait, make your way to uh, MIT and, and, uh, and, and make it through some of these other schools and lecturing at uh, Stanford if there's not a little bit of planning that's in the mix. Um, honestly, that happened really randomly. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, interesting. And I, I can tell you the story of that, but I think it's a bit, it's a bit over, like not necessary for this particular episode of the podcast. <laughs> but um, it was actually a complete mistake that I ended up where I did and got found by those people. Wow. Um, so... Where was I? You completely put me Sorry, off. Sorry, I, I, um, I threw you off target. So you yeah. were saying that... Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, having not been able to do that and kind of thought, is there like something wrong with me that I can't envisage like that? Five-year yeah. plan, yep. What I kind of learned, you know, with maturity was that things can come from left field. Like life can throw things at you that you had no idea were com that were coming. And so I actually now prefer the fact that I don't have such a fixed plan, so I'm able to be a bit more flexible to what happens. And yes, you've got to be resilient because sometimes like bad things happen, but it also means that when an opportunity like becoming a senior lecturer at MIT comes up that I had never planned, I could take it. I mean, I basically, so I will share a very like summary of how that happened. There was, there are, there's a conference called Unicon where all the heads of business schools around the world meet. And my co-author from my second book was invited to speak at that. And he's like, you know, like an older male mad professor type. And he had moved to Asia, so he couldn't do it. So he recommended me. I promise you when they saw me, I was not their idea of like a professor that they wanted to speak at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> and so... And, you know, it was like, it was far out of London and it was a really small honorarium. And I was like, it's going to cost me more to go there than, than, than I'm going to get paid. <laughs> and, but my friend said, look, like you should do it. It'll be good for you. And it, you'll be doing me a favor too, because obviously I can't do it. Um, so I went and, and did it. And I was literally, I remember just having all these people standing, towering over me saying, do you ever come to Boston? Do you ever come to like California? Do you come here? You, and I, I just put my hand out and got this stack of business cards. They all wanted a piece of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I flew to Stanford three weeks later and I just thought, no, I remember saying to my friend, I'm so bad with jet lag, I don't want to go. And he was like, are you stupid? You have to go. <laughs> so I did. Um, so yeah, that would have been quite a hard relationship for me to have regularly because, it, you know, coming to LA from London or San Francisco from London is is a lot of jet lag and I'm not good at jet lag. Um so then a while later, I went out to um, Cambridge, Massachusetts for a week and I attended some classes and I met some professors 
And then, you know, what happened, happened. But I promise you there was no plan to go back into academia. Yeah, um, yeah. That's a little bit of the magic that you talk about. Yeah. Yeah. How do your spiritual beliefs, if you feel comfortable getting mm -hmm. into it, so, you know, we all wear different hats. Mm -hmm. You're a neuroscientist, you're mm -hmm. a psychiatrist, you know, these are all different labels that we have. Mm -hmm. Talking to you as the person, mm -hmm. Um, not even saying that this has to be backed up by any particular science that's out mm -hmm. there. How do your spiritual beliefs layer on top of the message that you share with the world? So I was brought up in a Hindu household. So I you know, have that cultural heritage in my background. So things like yoga and meditation and spirituality have been a part of my life since I can remember. There was a time as a teenager and perhaps into my 20s, that I rejected a lot of that stuff because I just wanted to be like my friends. Um, and funnily enough, it was yoga that kind of brought me back into, into the fold because it you know, became very popular with my, my peers. And, and I was just such a natural at it. It was kind of like, oh, wow, okay, there is something to this, which is that you know, my heritage is obviously having like an impact here. And, and, it's, and it's also like a popular thing. And then about five years after that, I got divorced from my first marriage. And in trying to heal from that journey, I got really interested in um, Carl Jung's psychology and um, some Buddhist teachings. So that was the first time, and I wasn't conscious of it at the time, that sort of cognitive science and spirituality came and helped me together. Mm. And it could not have just been one or the other. Um, then I would say the next time was when I was writing the source and I was doing the research of, in the, into the cognitive science and visualization and manifestation. Um, that was quite a risk for me at the time. I don't think I was aware of how much of a risk it was for an MIT professor and, a, you know, and my business was really like consulting to hedge funds to write a book on manifestation. It was vision. a bold first book to put out by itself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And But I just didn't, I wasn't, I think I just did it because I didn't really think of that as a potential, potentially an issue. It was good. You didn't overthink it. Yeah. Right? You just put it out there. Yeah. That's quite a theme for me. Sometimes I've just got away with things because I just haven't thought about it too <laughs> carefully. Um, and, you know, I, for me, it was definitely a journey of bridging those things closer, science and spirituality. But actually it was, the response to it when it came out was was quite life changing for me. So how much it was not just accepted, but like you know how successful it was. It's mm. now translated into thirty eight languages. Incredible. Yeah. Um, Congratulations. By thank the way. you. And I love travel and languages, and you know understanding different cultures. And I speak quite a few languages, but um, my friend Alyssa, who's in LA, who I've got another story about her to share. She said to me it's like you're now speaking to people in 38 languages. And that was just like a wow moment for me. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess through social media, people know a lot more about you than they ever would have, you know, before that was a thing. And I've always been very private and considered my social media to be, you know, a professional channel. But I had dinner with my friend Alyssa in LA last night. And she said, you know, I look at your Instagram and I think, has she got an MD or a PhD? She might even have both. I mean, my friends, they don't care about my qualifications or anything at all. And she said, but now I look at your Instagram and I see restorative yoga and, you know, you're, you're like, you've got beauty endorsements, you're getting sent clothes to wear to show people. And and you're like really like bringing out your spiritual side. And and she said, it's just wonderful to see. And I, and I said, it's for the first time in my life, I'm really like showing all aspects of me that I've never really shown, shared before. Um, and that massively includes spirituality. And, and, you know, I'd even go as far as to say, it doesn't always have to be backed up by science. So um, I remember when I was on Dave Asprey's podcast and I said that he was like, wow, you're going to lose your position at MIT for saying <laughs> not everything has to be backed up by science. But no, it's been a really, really great journey for me. And, um, you know, having had a lot of parental and societal and educational expectation on me that I felt like, you know, under the weight of as a young person, um, I feel 
like very free to express kind of all facets of me now. And I love being a neuroscientist. As you can probably tell, I can talk about neuroscience for hours. But um, yeah, I, like, I think I've always treated my patients and my clients holistically. And I feel like I'm able to be like that more now as well. And that's, it's really nice. You can pass on the next question, but just curious as somebody who also comes from a similar background. Yeah. In the Hindu tradition, I come from the Hindu tradition on my dad's side, my mm -hmm. mom's side, culturally Hindu, but it's the Jain tradition. Okay, yeah. And uh, the belief in reincarnation mm -hmm. is something that both sides feel. And people would ask me when I was younger, I said, okay, you know, Hindus believe that, you know, the soul is never created nor destroyed mm -hmm. and that there are, you know, different life experiences on a soul in different aspects. Mm -hmm. That could be in this dimension, another dimension, whatever, people have different visions of it. When I was younger, I would say, yeah, you know, I believe in reincarnation just because mm -hmm. I was toting the line of mm. the things that were there. Interestingly enough, as, as I get older, as I got older, and I had some pretty profound experiences with um, psychedelics, which I've talked about previously mm -hmm. on this podcast in an assisted, you know, setting, mm -hmm. as well as just like deeply profound meditate, meditative mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. or oneness experiences, being in nature and kind of looking up at the stars and just having a feeling, I, f I more felt it then I believed it. Mm -hmm. So I don't walk around with the belief of, mm -hmm. hey, you know, the reason you got to be good is because karma is going to come and bite you in the butt in the next lifetime. And that's why you should be good to everybody. No, you should just be good because it's the golden rule. Yeah. How would you want to be treated? But I do feel like there's some sense of energy is neither created nor destroyed. And so mm -hmm. people would ask me today, I would say, they say, do you believe in reincarnation? I say, I don't know if I believe in it, but I feel it. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong. I've had some interesting guests on the podcast who are actually researchers at the mm -hmm. University of Virginia mm -hmm. who actually kind of study that whole world of mm. it's interesting. It's called validated past life experiences. Oh, wow. If you're ever interested in uh, connecting with them. Um, but yeah, I'm curious for you. How do you think about that? Yeah. So very similarly to you, when for, you know, as far back as I can remember, I was told by my parents that reincarnation is is absolutely true. And I obviously as a child didn't question that. And I didn't really think of it in terms of, you know, karma's gonna come back and bite you. I thought of it in terms of, it was comforting to me when I lost my grandparents, for mm. example. Um, and my grandfather, I was very, very close to my grandfather and he always told me that we'd known each other in a, in a past life. and. And actually my father always said that I was his mother reincarnated. And I remember as a little girl saying, but how do you know? <laughs> um, and and he would say to me, just like I know you've got big brown eyes and you know everything I know about you, I, I know. And if that's what your father tells you, you, you believe it, you know? So, so I, I believed it like with a kind of, not without question, but I believed it. Um, you grew up in it. Yeah. And then obviously, when you study Western medicine and neuroscience, it's it's kind of hard to put those two things together. But like I said, I find it very comforting. So I, I kind of like chose to keep that belief. Um, you know, recently as you get older and then and with COVID and everything, I have experienced a lot of grief. Like I've mm. lost more than 10 people I'm in so the last sorry, few yeah. years. Yeah. So sorry. So I've started reading about it more out of this sort of feeling of like, I have to know. And so I read Dr. Brian Weiss's work. I've led, mm. read um, Only Love is Real, but I know he's written other books as well. And I've just like, you know, researched it on the internet. And so he's an MD and a, you know, a, a therapist. So that's kind of convincing to the scientific side of me that he's, you know, have has all these case studies. But I would say like, you know, again, similarly to you, what I've felt it with the people that I love, that it's not a random coincidence that they've come into my life. So I feel like it from that point of view. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. That's neuroplasticity, the brain's nervous system's ability to change in response to deliberate focus and experience. We're the only species, as far as we know, that can rewire our nervous system deliberately in this way.